Hello and welcome back to my channel, Quirky What If. Join us as we delve into the realms of fanfiction and fantasy, bringing you the best stories and discussions. Today, we're kicking off the second part of our series, What If Deku Was Chainsaw Man? If you enjoy this video, please give it a like and subscribe for more content in the future. The author of this story is just low from fanfiction.net. All the relevant links are in the description. Feel free to say hello to the author on their profile. Now, let's dive into the fanfic. Chapter 12, Chainsaw Devil. Humid air wafts over small spills of murky liquid, precipitating and giving rise to a hissed exhalation of attenuated but serried steam. Each puddle is as dark as the sepulchral surroundings, damp echoes reverberating like fleeting footfalls. Shadows sweep the spacious zone even without a source of dim lighting, the flicker of the black void reflected by each tiny watery pool. Scratches litter the scuffed surface of the floor, the solid stone chipped and darkened like an asphalt road. A faint illumination gives way to the black vacuous abyss. Viscous fluid percolates like a cerulean lava lamp, the hefty shape of a silhouette floating from within the cylinder tank's soft glow casting a shadow in the ever-expansive umbra of darkness that is the room itself. Wires run from the bottom of the container, each cable a different color from the rest but all of them sharing the same haunting hum. Bobbing up and down to the suzerate tune, the delineated figure residing in the tank stirs with the filtrating fluid. Attached to the purlins and the rafters that loom overhead are a series of steel catwalks. Various metal bridges trail above as equally many cerulean containers. Hanging from the handrails is a young boy, watching with a scarlet stare obscured by long clumps of uneven hair that borders the same hue as the liquid in the tanks below him. Dried patches of skin around his eyes pull into wrinkles. He gnaws on the bottom of his chapped lip with flaxen-tinged teeth. The plain black clothes covering his body helps him to blend into the dark atmosphere. A being directly below the boy is acutely aware of the child's presence anyways. Even with a visual impairment, the lack of eyeballs to be precise, the man knows more than one may assume. Where empty sockets wallow in the marred mesh of disfigurement that is pure evil's face, is also torn tissue where a nose should be. Yet, the seated sinister force is one to be reckoned with, his heightened sense of hearing having him tilt his head to turn an ear and listen. A wicked smile graces the man's lips, presenting pearly white teeth close to ivory. A grin resides behind in his equally crystal clear ventilator mask, the respiratory support whirring with every intake of breath. Machines buzz behind him, large consoles plugged to even bigger modems providing a life support system. The medical equipment kept grouped together produces the sounds of a hospital hall, just at a lower decibel to the point of being a quiet ambience. Oxygen pumps through a valve and circuitry connects to even more wiring. Despite all this, the collection of equipment has the presence of powering a super weapon rather than keeping a human alive. The man may have taken severe damage during the battle with his greatest rival, but he still carries a vigorous aura of villainy. Doctor, a terrifying tranquil tone purrs through the parted lips of the man's grin. Like a vast expanse kept still on the surface such as the ocean, a bottomless depth of doom resides below the deceptively delicate decibel of voice. Then, a wave of wrath unbridles the sea until the disturbance becomes an overwhelming force. Status report, an authoritative switch sways all sense of direction and commands whoever gets caught in the tide to succumb to it. Green circular lenses twist to give the man's presence an attentive look. The short-statured scientist sits atop his own chair, albeit with less electronics engineered into its mechanical workings. The portly doctor wears a set of customized goggles that provide him with night vision to see in the dark, the usage of his eyes still detrimental to him unlike his master. My leech, the Namu has taken to my trial and testing. The scientist smooths out his bushy mustache with one hand while using the other to operate his chair lift with a joystick. It's finally responsive he lowers himself to be positioned across from his creation that resides within a preservation tank. The doctor's master broadens his grin until it's as deep as the crevices of his scarred face. Excellent. The foreboding reply lingers in the eerie echo of the chamber before he continues, if the nerve damage can be successfully reduced for a plentitude transference of quirks. Then the next phase of my plan can commence the bioengineered Namu that the villain speaks of floats in its tank, a pink brain organ exposed atop its head. The ashes where more glaring results of operation cover the creature's body lay dormant with the rest of it. A broad beak full of fangs is slightly parted, the maw making for a mouth that can't speak. It is. The doctor pauses to carefully consider the word he'll use to describe his progress, significant his mustache furrows with the curl of his lips. However, not enough for. He proceeds with caution as he admits there's still work to be done, human trials. I see, the smile coming from the scientist's master diminishes at that news. The man taps his index finger on the armrest of his chair, done as impatiently as the movement is done thoughtfully. A moment passes before he asks with a slight leer, what seems to be the delay, doctor. The doctor swallows his own spit, mouth suddenly gone dry. He nearly mistakes the saliva for blood, a copper tinge to the taste startling him. The Namu is primitive in its intelligence. He busies himself with explaining his creation's drawbacks in an attempt to quell his nerves. I made it compliant with orders. It's obedient to a fault the invention stares out at him like a dead fish from its tank, except. It requires those tasks in order to function the exposed brain stitched and stapled to the base of the monster's skull is essentially disabled. 
I'm afraid it's otherwise completely without a mind of its own, unable to think for itself. The scientist looks away from the malformed beast to gauge his master's reaction. The man hums as he mulls over the doctor's diagnosis of the Namu, a result of my quirk transference. The mind was not able to handle it all. He rests his jaw on the knuckles of his propped arm after inquiring for more information. Partially, the doctor shifts his chair with his joystick to maneuver himself to be in front of a computer station, while I have been working to remedy the extent to which the human body will allow such a strain of quirks. A few taps and clicks of his keyboard pulls up schematics and other scientific jargon. You also asked me to alter the brain to stimulate your quirks invasion to form a symbiotic relationship. The doctor plays a simulation on the screen to show the metaphorically rotted fruits of his labor. And this is the result of the experiment. The doctor's master turns his head to look away from the monitor and returns his general gaze to the direction of the Namu. Even without a set of eyes, he can somehow see. A millennia of accumulating quirks does more than enough to generate other means of sight. Whether echolocation and sonar as a bat perceives things suffices or infrared heat wave detection works, those are just a few ways to name a few. Trial and error, my lord. The doctor bows as low as he can go from the confines of his chair. After paying his respect, he sits back up and repositions his seat to shift back towards his master, I vow to resolve the issue eventually. We've already begun forcing memories in and out, the malicious man angles his head towards the boy in the rafters above him as he speaks. A smile begins to reshape itself across his faulted features despite his next sentence. I don't believe we have the time necessary to dally in that department anymore, dear doctor. The scientist scrunches up his face with confusion. Unlike his master, he is unaware of the boy's presence to find the open discussion humorous in any way. What would you have me do? He treads carefully as he asks for elaboration. We begin transferring quirks in small dosages to strengthen Tamira's immunity. The boy on the catwalk somehow flinches and freezes at the same time when he hears his name mentioned. A draft overtakes the room as though somebody opened a window, sending shivers down Tamira's spine as he bends down to hear better. The doctor feels as equally cold when his master levels an eyeless gaze with him. I think it's about time we provide the boy with a pet, don't you? The mad scientist sneaks a glance towards one of his other bioengineered creations, one that he kept for himself. It's a small rendition of the Namu, one of the failures. It cocks its head like a curious animal, its exposed brain not fully comprehending its own existence. The harmless creature makes its creator slightly protective as he pleads for it to stay with him, not Johnny. No, not Johnny. The scientist's master smirks with a hint of amusement. He folds his hands together while leaning back in his chair, fingers steepled in a tight interwoven connectivity. I believe a dog would be more sufficient. The scientist nor Tamir are expecting that to be the villain's drawn conclusion. Hey, dog. The doctor makes sure that he's hearing things correctly. There's no better bond than between a boy and his dog. The conniving undertone behind the man's vile grin speaks of more than just getting a child a pet. Consider this a new baseline experiment, one to further supplement the effectiveness of the end goal, and only the villain's mad scientist understands why with eyes as wide as the lens of his goggles. The decision to get Tamira a dog is self-explanatory when the doctor's master says, the only other bond that the boy has is with myself, after all. The stronger the relationship, the more willing to welcome the channeling of quirks. The doctor nods along with his master's thought process before agreeing that could work. Oh, dear doctor, I know it will. The villainous response is full of malice, and yet the boy in the rafters is none the wiser to his current guardian's devious scheme. The child named Mira is instead too fixated on his own hands. He stares at his open palms and the digits attached to them, twiddling his fingers. Crusted nails have specks of dust under them. He remembers the last time he had a pet dog, and what happened when those hands had touched it. The destructive power of his quirk makes him fold his fingers over, willing them to never brush against his new dog's fur. He refuses to hold the animal that his sensei plans on giving him. He'll never hold the dog. He'll never hug it. Chapter 13, Chainsaw Enemy. Clouds ruffle in ripples like a careening curtain that's been pulled back to let the sunlight shine through. Beyond the congregation of pure white nebulous are acres of bright blue. Izuku can't help but admire the sky that seems to shimmer as wind blows his hair into artistic swirls shaped similarly to the clouds above. Shade sweeps over the rooftop of Yue from where he's seated on its ledge, legs dangling in the breeze. A calm serenity fills the air with the tune of chirping birds. Whole grain bread that's been toasted golden brown crunches with the thick tomato and fresh lettuce that resides between slices as Izuku takes a bite of his sandwich. An aroma wafts from the food and becomes a fragrance that the air itself seems to savor as much as the boy does. Juicy flavors, warm and cold, tingle his taste buds as he chews on the combination of wheat and vegetable. Crumbs chip away and fall into Izuku's open bento box to bounce off Ziploc bagged orange slices and grapes. He'd gone up to the roof to have his packed lunches when he attended Alder during junior high. Eating on the top of his school feels oddly nostalgic as he munches on a mouthful of toasted bread he bit off from the corner of his sandwich. He watches the cherry blossoms planted below billow with another breeze that blows through, mind in a daze and his eyes entranced as pink petals flutter about in a huge flurry. Birds cease their singing and fly away, frantically flapping their wings that loose feathers float in their wake. 
I was wondering where you went. A feminine voice draws Izuku from his thoughts and has him turning his attention with his body to the stairwell behind him. He recognizes the girl coming from the roof accessway as his friend and classmate, but still feels his facial muscles pulling into a perturbed expression. Jiru. He wonders why she'd also be occupying the rooftop during their lunch period. Completely oblivious, he has a hard time deducing any valid reasoning. Even after she walks over to his spot to sit beside him with her own food, he can't figure it out. Dumbly, he asks, what are you doing up here? Kayoka flicks him on the forehead as though that'll jog his brain function to start working again. I've been looking for you, stupid. Izuku rubs his slightly sore temple as the girl huffs with disbelief. I should be the one asking you that question. A small shake of her head has Izuku lowering his. Oh oh. His neck bends as he sinks his head even lower. He only raises both after so that he can nervously scratch his scalp. I guess that's fair. His fingernails run through his curly green locks, sometimes splitting hairs and sometimes getting caught in the tangled mess. I got worried when I didn't see you in the cafeteria for lunch. We normally eat together, so I thought maybe something was wrong. Kayoka picks at the rice on her tray with a plastic spork but doesn't bother scooping any of it just yet as she side-eyes Izuku. Izuku looks away, avoiding her line of sight. I just... His voice catches in his throat like it's his sandwich before he swallows. Slowly, he turns his head to look at Kayoka again. She waits with gentle eyes. I don't like the stares I've been getting recently. Izuku holds the girl's gaze before adding, nobody wants me there. So I figured I'd go somewhere else. Kayoka winces with her eyes, I'm sure that's not the case, but she can see where the boy is coming from as he sulks with his sandwich. Even if it is, and everybody is still freaked out about what happened with Beck Hugo. Who cares? She tries blowing it off with a wave of her hand to loosen him up a bit. I don't. His shrug is a small one but he does seem to pick up on the carefree vibe. A wry smile is directed towards nobody in particular as Izuku looks up at the sky, I'm used to eating alone. Hey, Kayoka nudges him with her shoulder to remind him that she's still sitting next to him. He looks back at her as she says softly, you're not alone. Izuku's face turns a shade of red and he finds himself redirecting his gaze once again. Thanks, he mumbles his appreciation as his smile turns a bit more genuine. Kayoka blushes too, hers a tone of pink that matches the petals that have blown their way to the rooftop where she and Izuku reside. Yeah, she mumbles even quieter while looking in any direction but at the boy. A few seconds of silence pass between them before Izuku sighs and says, At least Bakugo's been avoiding me ever since instead of trying to start more trouble the weight of the sandwich in the boy's hand reminds him to take a bite. Kayoka nods, spooning a mouthful of her own food. He hasn't said anything about the fight either, no matter how much Kirishima or the others ask. The flimsy spork in her hand bends as she pokes at her rice again. She recalls the class trying to get answers out of him before the bombastic blonde blew up on them. Literally, a teacher had to come and separate him from the others after setting off the sprinkler system. I'm surprised. Izuku blinks back his shock before pressing his thumb into the toasted bread of his sandwich. Kayoka tilts her head when she hears the crunch of the bun. I didn't think he'd keep my quirk to himself afterwards. The girl listens closely to the boy's whispered words that are unclear whether they're meant for her or himself. She sets her utensil down on her tray, then fixes Izuku with a sad stare. You know you can't keep it hidden from everyone forever, right? Secrets come out eventually. She tries to be as gentle as possible as she warns him of the consequences of hiding his quirk. Izuku nods before putting the remainder of his sandwich back in his bento box. I know that. I'm just not ready. He loses his appetite and closes it. You saw how they reacted by just seeing what it can do. Kayoka reaches out to touch his shoulder consolingly, but pauses mid-movement, her hand hovering in place as she thinks better of it. Her hand lowers as she tries cheering him up with words of assurement alone. Some of our classmates are nice enough that I don't think it'll bother them once they know, at least, the ones I've spoken to. Maybe. Izuku shrugs noncommittally. Quickly, he hides his somber mood with a smile meant to cheer Kayoka up instead. Don't let me stop you from making friends either way though. Kayoka blinks, taken by surprise. She shrugs in return once she recovers. Hey, I really only know Yeirazu and Ishido so far. The boy's smile is contagious though. Who? He curiously cocks his head to the side as he inquires to know which of his classmates Kayoka is referring to. Kayoka pauses as she tries to think of a way to describe them. A faint blush dusts her face before she mimes holding something invisible, you know. Yeirazu is the one with the... Her blush deepens when Izuku realizes the positioning of her hands is in front of her chest. Izuku instantaneously turns red and shouts the first other distinguishable quality of the girl that he can think of, the ponytail. Kayoka looks away to hide her embarrassment as she nods. Why yeah, she mentally kicks herself for not choosing Yeirazu's hairstyle to describe her as Izuku had. Eager to get past the awkward mood, she switches to describing the other girl that she befriended. Ah, uh, and Ishido is the pink one. Kayoka's mind can't help but wander to thinking about the size of Ishido's bust too though. She seems nice. Izuku's reply sets her nerves on fire when she looks down at her boobs and mentally compares the size of them with her female classmates. What's that supposed to mean? Kayoka's ear jacks raise into attack mode to threaten the boy as the girl succumbs to a sudden surge of anger. Ah, oh, what the, I'm just saying she's a nice person. Izuku throws his hands up defensively while reeling back from the menacing display of the girl's quirk. 
He nearly falls off the roof's ledge as he tries scooting away to avoid getting assaulted by the pulses of her heartbeat vibrations. Fortunately for him, Kayoka's attack never comes. She simmers down with a huff. The girl crosses her arms and looks down at the tray in her lap. Her lunch stares lifelessly back at her as she thinks about Ishido, she has a crush on you. I think. Oh, Izuku's blush returns just as it was about to leave. He looks down at his own lap where he fiddles with his hands, his own thumbs wrestling themselves. Kayoka shyly raises her eyes to look at him, blushing as deeply as he is. The girl's ear jacks begin to squirm with her body as she sheepishly tries to tell Izuku something else, I also. Um, you know, sirens suddenly screech through the school's speaker system, the blaring noise making the girl stop mid-sentence to instinctively cover her ears with a grimace. Izuku pulls his legs up from the roof's ledge so that he can stand and look around. Kayoka slowly gets to her feet to glance towards the stairwell from which the noise is the loudest. The prolonged sound is an alarm that reverberates throughout the entire building as much as it rings outside. Izuku steps towards the ridge of the roof, peering over its ledge. From there, he can see the UA barrier has been breached by a crowd of paparazzi somehow. Instead of the security system's gate keeping people out, everyone is pouring in through the entrance. It's just a bunch of reporters. Izuku looks to his side to see Kayoka has joined him at the ledge to look over with him. We should be fine so long as we stay up here. He can't help but look past the reporters and still feel a cause for concern though. The barrier doesn't appear to be malfunctioning. It looks damaged. He doesn't voice his thoughts to worry Kayoka but he can't imagine a reporter destroying UAS gate just to get a scoop should they receive reprimanding for property damage. Izuku's gaze sweeps the grounds from the wall to the line of cherry blossoms. There, breaking off from the pathway and using the paparazzi as a distraction, Izuku spots someone in a black hoodie. I bet everyone in the cafeteria is panicking. Kayoka's own musings break his hyper-focus on the intruder but he doesn't quite lose sight of the trespasser either. He keeps his eye on the direction that the prowler is heading while listening to Kayoka say, we should probably let them know it's a false alarm. Izuku nods as he backs up towards the stairwell to head inside, yeah, good idea. He turns and begins to pick up his pace when he resolves himself to pursue the intruder that he saw entering the school. You stay here and let me deal with it, there's no need for both of us to get caught up in the chaos, but not without glancing over his shoulder to ensure Kayoka's safety isn't put at risk. Oh, sure, the boy is gone by the time Kayoka blinks back her confusion. She idly glances back down from her rooftop view, seeing her teachers have arrived to hold back the media frenzy and get the situation under control. Present Mike shouts at them to leave, his yelling almost as loud as the emergency siren's shrill shriek. The sound of Izuku's red sneaker slapping the school's tiled floor is barely audible under the mixture of raucous noises. Coupled with the shouts of distant students in the hallway over stampeding on top of one another, the boy is able to move through the corridors undetected. Izuku knows that his unnoticed movements don't bode well for the heroes catching UAS intruders should they be moving more stealthily than he. It's up to him to find and stop the trespasser somehow in such a case. So when Izuku finds the teacher's lounge left alone with its door ajar, he knows that he has to hurry. The boy frantically enters the room, nearly tripping on the carpet and stumbles into a plush couch. Across the way, between him and a small coffee table, is the hooded intruder. They're not just trespassing and damaging property, but they're stealing. A folder is flipped open, paper contents held oddly with one finger poised from each hand. Hey, Izuku shouts to get the thief's attention. The hooded intruder glances upwards, startled by the callout. A pair of beady red eyes peer out from shadowed and dried patches of skin. Chapped lips pair with a scar sneer at the hero student. The man emits a dangerous aura that makes Izuku hesitate and think twice about going any closer or saying anything else. The raised fingers of the hands holding the school's stolen documents slowly lower and touch down with the other digits. As though the paper had been thrown into a fire, they shrivel and rapidly turn to dust. Izuku's eyes broaden with his mind's horrific deduction of what the man's quirk is capable of. All it takes is five fingers to make contact with something for the touched object to decay almost instantaneously. With the paper evidence completely decimated, there will be no evidence as to what documents were viewed. A dark purple wisp of smoke starts to spiral until it creates a whirling vortex. A spinning motion creates a portal behind what Izuku deduces must be a villain. When a hot feeling bubbles up in his throat to make him cough, he almost believes the smog is a form of knockout gas. It's only when the copper taste of blood reaches his mouth that he realizes the bubbles were his own bodily fluids surfacing. He coughs into the crook of his arm, staining his sleeve. Izuku tries to step forward, but his body lurches with the motion and he's held back by his illness attacking him during the worst of times. The hooded villain slowly backs away into the warp gate behind him, red eyes watching Izuku all the while. Unable to chase the intruder due to his disease holding him down, Izuku glares back. The dark fumes close around the villain and gradually shroud him in the vortex until the dissipation of the smoke takes him with it. All of the deep purple shrinks towards the left pupil of his eye, and then, it blinks away. The villain vanishes. Izuku clutches his chest, groaning as he crouches to one knee. For some reason, his heart aches for the mysterious criminal. Chapter 14, Chainsaw Shoes An olfactory illusion of smell permeates the air, a metallic mixture of copper and iron generating rust. 
The aroma is more delicious than any flavor. A young girl inhales the scent through her nose, her cheeks puffing up from the air flowing in until they turn red. She squeals like the little schoolgirl that she is while she blushes intently, skipping in the direction of the alluring fragrance. Her navy blue skirt flicks and swishes with every hop, swaying in sync with the loose red neckerchief tied around her Kansai collar. Blonde buns bounce atop her tiny head as she prances merrily along the canal that stretches beside the desolate street of her neighborhood. She slides down the empty channel like it's a slide on a playground, giggling on the way down. Once she reaches the bottom, she dusts herself off and springs back to her exaggerated steps. A bridge running over the halfpipe stretches overhead further down the path. The sweet scent pulling her by her nostrils strengthens as she draws closer to it, the source coming from under the overpass. The girl skipping slows to a stop when she finds a group of boys crowding around the smell's origin. Quickly, before they can notice her presence, she runs to hide behind a torn tire tread and some filled-up trash bags. From the secret spot, she can see the boys are kicking another boy who's been beaten badly. The boy that's been hurt is slick with blood, and she knows when she breathes in the air that he's the one with such a mouth-watering aroma. A widespread grin stretches across the girl's facial features, tiny fangs glaring in the sunlight. A sharp kick cuts the already battered boy's cheek open, eliciting a spray of blood like the juices of a peeled tangerine. Some of the droplets dot the blonde girl's clothes, but a singular bit of residue lands on her chin. Full of delight, she licks the liquid from her skin and relishes in its tangy flavor. A pair of feline eyes narrow into thin slits as they watch closely, the girl's yellow gaze captivated by the scene in front of her. The boy being kicked around curls in on himself defensively, not even trying to fight back. Every bit of blood they take from him makes her shiver. Only when who the girl supposes is the group's ringleader holds a hand up to signal the end of the boy's misery do they cease the beatdown. Everybody steps back as though they're giving their victim some room for his labored breathing. All but the boss of the bunch, a spiky-haired blonde, who stalks forwards to get closer. The group's leader bends down to grab the bloody boy by his notably green hair, forcing his punching bag to look at him. Learn your lesson yet. The rhetorical question goes unanswered and then the blonde boy slams the other boy's face into the rough cement of the canal to grind it back and forth, know your place. Blood smears across the ground from the beaten boy's broken nose. A muffled moan expresses the boy's suffering enough to be satisfying for his tormentor to stop. The blonde boy then steps on his victim's back and uses the body as leverage to stand up, stay beneath my foot. When the blonde boy spits on the submissive boy and adds, fucking villain. The blonde girl that has been watching the whole time snaps out of her trance. No longer does she marvel at the scene. Her grin recedes until she loses her smile completely, replaced by a pouty frown. Suddenly, she's no longer entertained by the band of bullies drawing blood from their victim. Yeah, stupid villain. One of the other bullies chimes in with a cackle. The girl balls her pudgy hands into tiny fists as she listens to the rest of the boys join in on the mocking laughter. That same bully who's wearing a backwards baseball cap points towards their victim's feet with an elongated finger. Hey, how come Deku has all might sneakers if he's a villain? A malicious grin stretches across his face as he suggests, we should take his shoes. The bull is cheering and collective agreement drowns out any weak noises of protest that their prey can muster. They remove the green-haired boy's shoes without much resistance. A final few jeers about the boy being a villain despite their cruel behavior being highly hypocritical is what they leave their victim with after stealing his sneakers. Each of them climb up the canal to ride away on their bikes, leaving the beaten boy to wallow in his own blood. Only after all of the bullies have left does the girl venture out from her hiding place. She stares at the unmoving green-headed boy with something akin to pity in her eyes, looking past his physical injuries and considering the mental abuse he'd just suffered as well. The girl can empathize with the boy, having been called a villain herself. She wonders if the reason why the boy didn't bother fighting back was to try and prove them wrong. He has his eyes sealed shut, completely unaware of her presence. Her shadow looms over him as she tries to figure what about the boy could seem so villainous to warrant such a brutal beating. The boy appears unassuming, almost plain. Then again, nobody would imagine a young schoolgirl like her has such a vile villainous quirk either. The blonde girl frowns and shakes her head to clear out all of the negative thoughts swarming her mind. She instead does what she always does to push down those dark desires and impulses. She smiles. An ear-to-ear -ear grin like earlier returns to her face as she bends down to the injured boy's level. Hi. Her bright and bubbly squeak of a voice doesn't match her mood but it completely fools the boy when his eyes snap open to see her grinning at him. The bun blonde waves to him despite being so close before reaching that same hand out for him to grab, my name's Himiko Toga. What's yours? Timidly, perhaps even cautiously, the boy matches the gesture with a shaky hand before taking hers. Izuku Midoriya. His soft voice blows away with the wind that runs through the canal. Himiko pulls and helps him to slowly sit up. He winces from pain but bites back any complaints. When he's propped upright, he realizes they're still holding hands and quickly pulls his away, a blush blends with red splotches of blood on his face. Himiko giggles, a blush of her own fading and when she remembers the reason why she had been drawn to the boy in the first place. Oddly, coupled with a few freckles on his cheeks, she thinks he looks really cute covered in all that blood. A tinge of the taste she got earlier lingers on her tongue, making her mouth water. 
when her slanted eyes land on his shoeless feet, her smile sobers and she swallows her saliva to temporarily quench her thirst. Emiko's pitying look returns as she thinks about the bullies calling him a villain. Izuku surprises her when he musters some strength to the tone of his weak voice. Why you don't have to pretend to be nice to me, you know. The boy stares at her with eyes as fragile as glass that she can see the cracks in them. She falters as she thinks he's seen through her facade of a grin and discovered the cracks in her own mask. When his shoulders slump and he looks away though, she realizes that he's not reading that deep, that he's simply seeing the surface level of what he's used to. I'm fine. His mumble is back to its delicate decibel as he lowers his head. It's Izuku's turn to be startled when he hears Himiko's tougher tone. You're not fine. She stands up from her crouch so that she can broadly gesture at their surroundings. There's rocks and broken bottles down here, so it'll hurt to walk around without shoes. The gesturing of her hands goes to his feet before she grabs at her own. I'll lend you one of mine. If you wear one shoe, only one of your feet will hurt. The girl slips off a red sneaker and holds it out to the boy. It's her favorite, the color of blood, but she offers it with a smile anyways. W what? Izuku's bafflement leaves him in a staring stupor. When he doesn't take the shoe himself, Himiko tosses it towards him. He reflexively catches it, snapping out of his daze. And no, seriously, I'm fi, um, I mean, I don't need it. He holds the red sneaker out for her to take back while frantically shaking his head. The bright color of the shoe matches the blush returning to his bloodied face as he stumbles over whatever other words he fails to muster. Emiko hops back on one foot, her grin growing as she releases a teasing titter. Then give it back to me. She turns and skips a small distance away before turning back and urging him on with a wave to follow. Come on. Come give it back then. Hey, hey. Izuku's brain slowly processes that the girl is running away from him. Hurriedly, he forces himself to his feet to chase after her. W wait. Your shoe. What is with? Izuku grunts when he steps on a pebble. Suddenly, the blonde's tactic is clear to him and he's left with no other choice. He begrudgingly pulls on the single sneaker Hamiko gave him. You gotta be kidding me. Hamiko half limps as she tries to stay ahead of the boy when he pursues her. Oh, oh, oh. The fabric of her sock isn't enough to protect her foot like a shoe sole can as she runs through the empty channel. Behind her, Izuku winces with every step in a similar state of self-inflicted pain as he tries to keep pace with the girl. W wait up. Stop. Izuku begins to close the distance between them when Emiko starts climbing the halfpipe to reach the road above. He clambers to follow her and matches her movements. The incline makes for a concrete hill to slightly hike, one that leaves both of the kids breathing heavily by the time that they reach the top of it. There, Emiko puts her hands on her hips to pose as triumphantly as she sounds, now we're out of the pit. The sidewalk makes for a more flat surface that the two can stand on evenly with one another. Until Emiko bends down to pull off her other sneaker, here. Take my other shoe too. Now both of your feet will be protected on your way home. Then no, thank you. Izuku tries pushing the offered shoe away but it winds up in his hands anyways. He looks down at the red sneaker. The one he has on already fits surprisingly well. I, I don't need your shoes. But he still tries to return them. Then throw them away. Himiko waves the shoes away when Izuku tries giving them back. The boy's perturbed expression leads her to respond with an exaggerated shrug and an excusive explanation, they're old anyways. H huh. He takes another look at the red sneakers but sees nothing that would show their age like the girl says they are. Considering how young she is, they should be mudded or scuffed from playing, but there's not a single mark. The shoes are brand new, as though they had been bought just for Izuku to last a lifetime. And Mika looks at the boy closely, still trying to see what kind of path he'll choose to walk. Hey, Izukun, he blushes when she twists the kanji in his name to be affectionate and not Deku. Though he can also hear how serious her tone is. He can see her solid expression. Whether you walk on this side of the divide or that one. He can see the split between her quiet neighborhood and the clamorous city that the canal makes. And he can understand that there's something special about the way that she's addressing him that goes beyond just kindness. The sun becomes the settled heart of the horizon, illuminating the line between villains and heroes, with Izuku's shadow casted in the middle. Himiko squints to see whether the boy's future will be as bright as the sky or as dark as his silhouette as she says, I hope to see you standing proudly. Chapter 15, Chainsaw Cataclysm Subdued but otherwise bright light from the morning cascades the classroom through tilted window blinds. It's early in the day that a flaxen sleeping bag still resides out in the open. Hovering above the empty bedroll behind a broad desk are a student and the man that would ordinarily occupy that yellow sleeping bag. Izuku's overworked and underslept homeroom teacher pinches the skin of his temple in a vain attempt to soothe the headache that threatens to turn into a migraine. First your responsibility with Bakugo and now this, Aizawa just listened to his student's story of how Yue had been broken into and how the boy had encountered that intruder without alerting any staff sooner. I should have you expelled, he has half a mind to avoid dealing with another problem child but thinks better of it when recalling the whole purpose of his job is to help with the kid's development into a reliable hero. If it weren't for Vlad and I scheduling beforehand, I'd have you be the one to miss today's field trip. Aizawa mulls over alternative punishments that he could provide instead but doesn't get very far in his thought process before other students begin filing in. For now, just take your seat, Aizawa sighs while shooing Izuku away. Oh, good morning. It's good to see you arrive early for once, Midoriya. Tenya moves like a robot that hasn't been oiled as he gives his classmate a stiff wave. 
Perhaps it's much too early in the day even for him to fully function just yet. H. Hey, Yuda, I'm just here because I was meeting with Aizawa Sensei beforehand. Izuku's wave is so much softer by comparison that it barely lifts high enough to even register as a wave. He slumps into his desk chair just as equally exhausted. He hadn't slept much last night, his dreams plagued by nightmares of the villain that he exchanged glares with. Ah, I see, Tenya nods as he sits at his own desk. When he settles in, he sees an unfamiliar face filing in behind everybody else and stands back up. Excuse me, I believe you're in the wrong classroom. He chops with an outstretched arm to stop a girl with vines for hair from going any further. But Aizawa grabs the boy's arm and moves it so that the girl can get through. Actually, class rep, she's supposed to be here. The teacher has her stand off to the side as he explains. I called her to our class today for a reason that I'll explain shortly after everybody is seated. Tenya's eyes widen behind his glasses before he drops into a bow. He bends deep at the waist, my apologies. Bifocals nearly falling off of his face that he has to catch them before they can. Who's the hottie? The shortest student in the class ironically sits in the back that he has to strain in order to see up front. His eyes are as big and round as the purple balls atop his head. As some of you may have noticed, a member of Class 1B will be joining us today in place of Bakugo. Aizawa raises his voice so that the whole class can hear as he introduces the girl. This is Ibarra Shuzaki. Please give her a warm welcome. Thank you for having me. She humbly places both of her hands together and gives everyone a polite bow. The vines serving as her hair are tied into a neat cross shape that drapes her forehead, showcased as part of her courteous presentation of herself. Not that I'm complaining to have a cutie come by, but I don't get it. The boy with a lightning streak in his hair runs a hand through his blonde locks as he ogles the newcomer. Sparks flicker from his fingertips, but they fail to jumpstart his brain as he scratches his head. As part of Midoriya's and Bakugo's punishment, they'll be alternating classes by weekly intervals. Aizawa shoots Izuku a quick glare that makes the boy reflexively duck down. Izuku feels everybody else's eyes on him too but knows better than to add on the detail about additional homework or the formal apologetic essay he's supposed to write if he wishes to make a vain attempt of soothing his situation. It was Nezu's idea to keep them separated this way, so if you don't like it, then take it up with the principal. Aizawa finally moves his glare away from solely Izuku and fixes it on the rest of the class. So Bakugo is going to miss the field trip today. Yuraka winces sympathetically for the boy. Man, what a bummer that must be for him, and Ijiro mimics her expression with a nod. If all of you don't quiet down and get ready, then you'll miss the bus and nobody will go on the trip. Aizawa shuts them up before any other students put in their two cents. He thrusts a thumb over his shoulder to urge them on while saying, Hurry to the lockers if you want to wear your hero costume or gym uniform. Right. Depending on the sort of activity we'll be doing, our outfits might be ill-suited and just get in the way. Momo pauses to mull over her own decision while everybody else starts filing out of the room and into the hallway. Where was it that the syllabus said we're going? Something about rescue training. Hanta glances around as he asks his question to nobody in particular. The blonde boy with a tail for his quirk blinks back his surprise due to having an equal lack of information. Rescue training? Huh. Sounds like another tough day. He scratches the back of his head as he shakes it side to side with dismay. The invisible girl's floating school uniform perks up from beside him before bumping his side to get him as excited as she is. Are you kidding? Come on. This is what being a hero is all about. I'll be right at home in a flood, and the greenette with some resemblance to a frog can't help but agree with her fellow female. Ijiro flashes a pointy-toothed grin as he listens to his classmates and becomes as equally excited about the school trip. Though he also notices Ibarra is being awfully quiet in their company. He turns to her in an attempt to get her to join in on the conversation, what about you, new girl? She smiles kindly at him, seeming to appreciate the attempt to get her involved. I'm grateful to be a part of today's trip if it means learning how to help others. The sun beams through a window that they're passing so that Ibarra almost appears to have an angelic halo hovering over her viny head while she answers. So modest. A good number of the class are awestruck by how humble the girl is. When the class reaches the locker rooms, they begin to split based on gender. Rescue training is completely different from battling, you know. The boy with a lightning streak in his hair brushes shoulders with Izuku as he passes by. You probably shouldn't use your quirk, Midoriya and mumbles under his breath, whatever it is. Overhearing the comment, Tenya frowns and steps in between them. I told you, Midoriya is our fellow classmate and I won't tolerate any sort of bullying. It's not the first time somebody said something ill-minded but he feels the need as class representative to intervene this time. Especially when in the presence of Izuku himself. I it's okay, Hida, I deserve that. Izuku gently pulls Tenya away by the shoulder as he feigns a chuckle to laugh it off. When Izuku's hand falls away, it lingers somewhere in the middle that he finds himself staring at it. I know how destructive my quirk can be. I don't need you or Aizawa reminding me all the time. But then again, I did use it anyways when I fought with Ka Bakugo. So, yeah, the boy that usually hangs around the lightning-themed blonde cocks his ball-covered head to the side. Why do I do you use your quirk on Bakugo if you knew it would hurt him? Izuku turns his gaze from his hand to his classmate, the same reason he used his quirk on me. Or, at least, I hope for the same reason the reminder that Bakugo fought as equally haphazardly gets some of the boys to look away. 
We each had something to prove to one another and we'd have just been disrespecting the other had we not used our quirks to go all the way. But Izuku hadn't intended for the equal share of blame to be his justification that he continues with his explanation and elaborates to give them his true reasoning. I guess that makes sense, Hanta pulls on the top of his hero uniform before glancing towards the others to see what they think. Izuku begins getting changed when he realizes the others are nearly ready to leave the lockers too. I don't completely get it, but it sounds like a manly enough reason to me. Ajiro flashes a thumbs up to show his support which gets Hanta to smile and give the same gesture. Midoriya, all eyes suddenly flick to the boy at the back of the locker room. He's usually quiet, keeping mostly to himself. However, from his lone bench, the even split of contrasting colors in his hair stands out as much as his voice now as he asks, Do you regret your decision? Izuku finds his classmate's heterochromic gaze and holds it for a second. The question is one that Izuku would have never considered until now. He breaks eye contact to look at himself. His bare chest exposes the dangling pulley string attached to his sternum. Unlike some of his classmates who are stuck with additional appendages like a tail or who are completely invisible at all times, he can choose whether to activate his quirk or not. Midoriya, Tenya cautiously and gently prods at Izuku when he sees his peer spacing out. It's okay, the heterochromic hero student stands up and hurriedly heads for the exit, you don't have to answer that. Izuku looks after his classmate but doesn't call out or chase after him. Let's not dally, everyone, especially when Tenya gives him and the other boys a stern reminder that Aizawa is waiting for them to finish getting dressed for the trip. When they all do finally finish changing, they funnel out towards the front of the school where they find a bus waiting. It's good to see you all made it here. Aizawa dramatizes his impatience by checking his wrist for a watch that isn't there, you're only half a minute late. Sorry, sensei. However, we shall make up for time with my seating chart. Everyone line up according to your ID numbers and fill those seats in an orderly fashion. Tenya takes charge with one hand chopping in a directory pattern while the other presents a drawing he made for them to follow. Heat is going full throttle. Your rock a sweat drops as the class rep instructs everyone to load into the bus in an orderly fashion. She's torn between wanting to laugh or cringe. Is he always this diligent? Ibarra follows in line with everyone else but still whispers a question to the pinquette that she's with. That's one way of putting it, Mina grins. She doesn't even try to stifle her giggle. But all of the effort the class rep puts into their seating comes to a crashing halt once they actually begin to board the bus. Gah, darned, it was this type of bus. Tenya sulks when he sees the layout is completely different from what he had planned. All that work for nothing, Momo shakes her head at the sorry sight before taking her seat. As Izuku finds his own, Kayoka tags along and sits beside him. Hey, she greets him as casually as she can before asking, you holding up okay? Yeah, Izuku schools his expression to hide whatever he was letting show through in case the locker room incident shook him up more than he had thought before replacing it with a smile. Thanks for asking. Suddenly, Mina practically falls backwards to shove her way between him and Kayoka. Mind if I squeeze in here, Midori. Her usual grin looks mischievous to Ibarra that the religious girl finds another place to sit. Recalling what Kayoka had told him on UAS roof, Izuku finds it difficult to quell his anxiety with how close of a proximity she's made for herself with him. Ah. Um, uh, ribbit, the frog-like greenette of the class chimes in from the other side of the boy. Izuku is startled at first, but feels slightly thankful for the distraction when she takes his attention for herself. Midoriya, I generally say what's on my mind, though he's fully aware of how she wedged herself in as well. Why is that so? Izuku tilts a curious head to the side as he braces himself for whatever it is that she has to say. Past Mina, Kayoka turns an ear to listen in too. I can't help but wonder why you keep your quirks so secretive. The greenette places a finger on her chin as a thoughtful gesture. It makes me feel like you have something to hide that you don't want us all knowing about. Eavesdropping across the way, Hijiro nods along. Yeah, man. I respect privacy and all but it kinda hurts that you aren't willing to trust us. He tries to be as delicate as he can when broaching the topic after the boys' locker room conversation but voices his own opinion on the matter. Once again, the bi-colored boy in the back of the bus shocks everyone by chiming in, could you be the secret love child of All Might and you don't want to reveal your relation by displaying a similar strength quirk? That's oddly specific, your Raka blinks a few times as she processes the boy's theory. Todoroki has a point though. Hanna snaps his fingers as though the conspiracy has just been cracked before pointing towards Izuku for confirmation. Dude, are your parents pro-heroes? Uh, no. Sorry to get anybody's hopes up. Izuku quickly shakes his head to debunk the hypothesis and glances at everyone apologetically when he sees some of them becoming sullen with disappointment. What then? Are they villains? The boy with a lightning streak in his blonde hair crosses his arms as he leans back and jokingly presents his own proposition. When he sees Izuku's reaction, he uncrosses them and leans forward. Oh my god. Are they? No, no, they're not. Izuku immediately denies the boy's claim but recoils when he realizes that he may have done so too forcefully. He sees some of his class aren't convinced by his hasty response. I met his mom. Kayoka frowns at the students shying away from Izuku and defends him as best as she can. She's super sweet, so. 
she's not a villain Izuku casts her a sidelong grateful glance. Mina swivels her head from the girl on her one side to the boy on her other to ask, What about your dad, Midori? Izuku shifts uncomfortably as he nervously scratches the back of his head. He works overseas, so I hardly get to see him. He looks down on his feet to avoid making eye contact with his class, worried that they won't believe him. I bet his dad's a villain, the same blonde from before mutters in a not-so-quiet whisper. The ball-headed boy he normally hangs around with nods in agreement. Izuku closes his eyes, having expected that kind of response. Kayoka frowns, hearing them loud and clear thanks to her quirk. When the bus bounces over a speed bump, she shoots one of her jacks out to jab the blonde in the neck. Whoops, missed my charging port, she feigns the attack as an accident while pumping her heartbeat into the boy in order to give him a shock. Once the class gets the message loud and clear, she returns to her seat, look everyone. Maybe we should talk about something else. No need, but Aizawa stops the class discussion when he stands up from the front of the transportation vehicle. The bus comes to a stop as he announces their arrival, we're here. Whoa, several students twist in their seats to look out the window and exclaim in awe. Wow, it looks like a giant dome. Ijiro marvels at the massive structure that resides at the top of a stone staircase just outside the bus. Is it an observatory? Mina excitedly hops off the bus as she examines the building's curvaceous shape for herself. Maybe it's a planetarium. The invisible girl bounces beside her while suggesting an alternative reason for the strange design. We're doing rescues in an observatory planetarium. The tailed blonde of the class deadpans as he steps in between them to get a look at the structure too. Okay, maybe not either of those. Mina scratches her head when she realizes her singular brain cell even when combined with another won't be enough to guess what's inside. You'll all see soon enough, Aizawa grumbles more so to himself as he leads his class up the steps of the tall staircase. When he pushes the doors open, he closes his eyes and wishes he could plug his ears as he prepares for the next barrage of overly excitable exclamations. Wow, maybe it's Universal Studios Japan. Yuraka makes her own guess when she sees all sorts of varying environments that look like sections of an amusement park. Aizawa sighs as he tries to correct her and explain to everyone where they're really at. No, it's the USJ. It is Universal Studios Japan. But Mina's girlish squeal of joy cuts him off before he can get another word out. It's not. Aizawa's eyes snap open as she shouts for everyone to quiet down. Once the rambunctious bunch settles for occasional murmurs, he tries again. USJ stands for Unforeseen Simulation Joint. This is where you'll be simulating rescues in various unforeseen disaster scenarios. The homeroom teacher tries not to yawn as he gives his tired explanation. That's right. There's a conflagration zone for fires, a landslide zone, a flood zone, and more. I ought to know. I built this facility myself. An astronaut-themed hero climbs a staircase to join everyone at the entrance while piggybacking off of Aizawa's description of the USJ. Whoa, it's 13, to which Yuraka practically glows with delight. The brunette instantly recognizes the rescue hero. Yes, 13 will be overlooking today's trip as a special guest. Aizawa's dull tone is a sharp contrast by comparison, but he still tries to wave his arm with a mild flourish anyways. 13, take it away. And away we shall go. But first, some points to make. 13 raises a gloved finger to get everybody's attention. A few students chuckle or snort at the pun. When the tip of the poised finger pops open like a bottle cap, they gasp in shock. I'm sure many of you are aware that my quirk is called Black Hole. It can suck and tear anything apart, a wispy fog edges from the brim of the opening that makes up the hero's quirk to which they are referring. You used it to save a ton of people from disasters. Your Raka enthusiastically nods while raising her arms over her head to be called on should the hero ask them about their quirk. Indeed, 13 gives the girl a single nod of acknowledgement, but takes a serious tone that sobers your Raka quickly, however. 13's head swivels to look at everyone. My power can easily kill, Izuku sees his own reflection in the hero's black face visor, I've no doubt there are some of you here with similar abilities. In our superpowered society, the use of quirks is heavily restricted and monitored. It may seem that system is a stable one, but we must never forget that it takes one wrong move with an uncontrollable quirk for someone to die. Izuku listens intently as the hero's words resonate with his beating heart. During Aizawa's physical fitness test, you came to learn of your hidden capabilities and potential. 13 seems to be looking directly at him now. Through All Might's battle training, you discover the danger your quirks can pose to each other, and Izuku understands why he was allowed to attend this lesson even after his mistakes. Combining those lessons, this session will teach you how to properly regulate your power to save lives. Bravo. Amazing. It all comes full circle. As expected of UA, Tenya claps with exaggerated movements as he looks around at his peers to get them to join in his applause. I'm not finished yet, but 13 makes him realize his mistake and he ceases the praise abruptly. My apologies. Tenya bows at the waist to hide his fierce blush of embarrassment. A few snickers and giggles surround him. Your powers are not meant to inflict harm. Izuku finds himself staring into the blank space of 13's face mask once again. I hope that you leave here today with the understanding that your quirks are meant to help people and not hurt them. Then, Izuku's eyes are drawn to a whirling vortex of ornate purple, the dense fog flickering and licking at the turbulent air. It's a gateway to danger, and the danger is coming through. At the center of the USJ, the water fountain stops working. 
so do the lights lining the roof. Every bulb bursts and blows out as the power stops functioning. Get behind me. Aizawa notices now that there's a major shift in the atmosphere and jumps in front of his class with reckless abandon. A pair of yellow goggles cover his eyes as he unfurrows the capture cloth that he usually keeps wrapped around his neck. Izuku and the others see why their teacher is suddenly so defensive when a collection of other costumed people begins pouring in through the winding vortex. It's a gateway reminiscent to a black hole, as ironic as 13's quirk disclosure had been when comparing the two. What the heck is that? More robots like the entrance exam. Ijiro squints his eyes as he tries to get a look at the people coming through the warp gate. Is that class 1B? Mina looks at Ibarra in the hopes that they're being joined by the other hero students. When Ibarra shakes her head, face paling, the Pinquette's skin tone loses color too. Nobody move. Those are real villains. Aizawa grits his teeth together as he watches the endless march of enemies entering the facility. Wave after wave, the amount of opponents piles up until the hero students are outnumbered. Below, the crowd of villains part as three figures stride out of the portal. First, a slender young man with silvery blue hair, his baggy black articles of clothing clipped tight in clenched hands that seem to hang off and perch across his body. Two of those severed limbs are clasped around his neck like a noose, and one looks almost like a gas mask as it wreathes his mouth in the purple fog. To his back, a massive form strides out with heavy stomps of large feet, hunched over as it looms around him. Black-skinned and clawed hands, with a beak jaw that peeks out from beneath an exposed brain. Across its arms and back, deep gashes and scars are embedded into its skin. None of those valleys of the dark canyon are stitched, stretched apart to show raw muscle fiber. The violet mist that makes up the portal swirls together to form a strange man-shaped silhouette with a layered metal collar. His body is nothing but flickering smoke and shadow, with two gaslight eyes that peer around. As the three villains come to a stop, the leader who's wreathed in severed hands glances up and around. Even this far away, Kayoka can hear the leader's voice without issue, and judging from the shifting of Izuku's head, he can make it out too. Around them, the class is panicking and shouting about how this isn't possible. But those who can hear the villains are far more focused on the threat at hand. Hmm, I was expecting All Might would be here. What a shame, the villain leader hums as he scratches the underside of his neck with a casual yet unsettling demeanor. Aizawa and Thirteen whisper something between one another, hero to hero. Likely, it has to do with strategy. It could also have to do with the intruder during the media leak on school grounds being one and the same as the villain group's leader down below. Try both of those but as well as the true discussion they are having revolving around All Might's absence too. When the villain leader says, maybe some dead kids will bring All Might running, Aizawa snaps his attention back to them. Thirteen, get them out of here. He leaps into the fray without a second to spare. Thirteen springs into action too, heading for the doors to help the class escape as instructed. But they don't get very far. Everything happens so fast. One second, they're running for the exit. The next, they're cut off by a wall of darkness. The purple void is the same as the portal that had allowed the villains to invade the facility. Greetings. A chillingly calm tone sweeps over the class the same as the villains' bulked body's shadow as a representative of the League of Villains. It is my duty to scatter you and request you scream loud enough for all might to hear. No. Thirteen is unable to stop the villain from teleporting the hero students in separated groups through their own personalized warp gates. There's no air that pushes against Izuku's face. He's not falling. He's merely suspended in place. The darkness pulls in, swallowing him whole, and there's nothing he can do to stop it as he hovers in what feels like a severe storm cloud. He knows that the entry to this vacuity has closed behind him. Yet, what's in front of him and below him is nothing better. He looks down and sees a deep dark abyss that's staring back. The darkness reaches out for Izuku, its hands trying to wrap around him so that he can be pulled down, it's fighting its own stubbornness of keeping him motionless. The void is beckoning for him to drop. Izuku falls out and lands in a pile of what would be soft sand if not for the small sharp pebbles scattered in it. He's in a construction zone. However, he's not alone. Kayoka and Momo land on either side of him, followed by Ibarra from Class 1B. The girls don't notice him until he notices there are villains here just like there was at the plaza of the building. Jiru, Izuku glances back only momentarily. He whips his head in the direction of sinister cackles. Villains surround them, not allowing him to take his eyes off the opponents. Looks like we've hit the jackpot boys. A serpent-skinned villain runs a slim tongue along his scaly lips. I call dibs on the petite one. Izuku's heart thumps heavily in his chest. This isn't like the times Bakugo and the others dragged him to their usual spot to beat on him. This kind of scum wants to have their way with Kayoka and the other girls. Izuku grabs a handful of his shirt, the clump of material bunched up in his fist. When he pulls, the buttons holding his shirt together pop off. His other hand snatches the cord that's let loose. Surrounded by villains, he has no other choice but to tug on it. Izuku snarls a warning as he stretches the line, Jiru. Cover your ears. Then comes the roar. Chapter 16, Chainsaw Bite. Snowflakes drifting through frigid air sting Izuku's freckled rosy cheeks, each icy speck a bitter bite when it sticks to his skin. The young boy tugs at the snood scarf wrapped tightly around his neck, pulling the brim just a tad higher to warm his bottom jaw. His mother bundled him up in layers of wintry clothing to protect him against the cold environment while he goes out to play but the cheap material of his coat isn't lined with enough fur to do the trick. 
Izuku shivers as his feet sink into the frosty floor below him, boots making the ice crunch. Snow rests upon the smooth surface of a park bench, making for a natural feather cushion. That same sheeting covers the playground too. Izuku blinks, batting frost from his eyelashes, before looking around. Tree branches have lost their leaves, brittle bark creaking as wind shakes snow from the renovated foundations. Chain links swing sway in the breeze despite being iced over. Slide tubes whistle through their vacant tunnels. More snowflakes drift down to lay atop everything, gradually adding another inch of the white powder. Suddenly, the small specks make way for a collection of them, the compacted shape of a ball whizzing through the air. It bursts open on impact with Izuku's face, showering crystalline fragments as the ice returns to a semi-liquid form. The boy sputters as the snow gets in his mouth and up his nose, forcing him to rub at his face to clear away the residue. He hears a girl's joyous laughter coming from the direction from which the snowball had been thrown. When he peels back his eyes to look at the culprit, he sees the blonde that had lent him her shoes not too long ago. Toga. Izuku whines with a pout over being pelted by a cheap shot. He had somehow not noticed her presence until now, allowing her to get in a good sneak attack. Now though, he can see the girl is bundled in her own winter coat with a bright red scarf draped around her neck. That's not fair. I wasn't ready. Izuku crosses his arms over his chest with a huff that creates a cloud of condensation. Lowering his guard proves to be a mistake, the lack of free arms or hands to defend himself leaving the boy vulnerable. Izuku is wide open for another snowball that nails him in the forehead this time. He flails backwards with a startled shout, waving his arms out in front of him to deflect much too late. A mild mark of red glows from where the boy had been struck, snow specking the surrounding area. The girl across the way grins, flashing her pointed teeth. She tosses a spare snowball up and down, catching it each time in one hand. The other hand rests on her hip. I told you to call me Hamiko, Izukun. The blonde blushes at the same time as the green-headed boy when she refers to him by her personally chosen nickname for him. Izuku fights the urge to sniffle. He's not sure whether he's catching a cold or if he's having a hard time keeping his emotions in check. The only other nickname he'd been referred to as was Deku, and that had been more of a way to taunt him. To be on a first-name basis with someone who refers to him affectionately, and a girl no less, the boy is at a loss. Izuku panics and reacts by throwing those thoughts away, not sure how to deal with them. He tosses them in the form of a snowball, scooped and hastily crafted to be made on short notice. It's a small projectile compared to the ones Himiko had created. The molding isn't very firm and the boy's throw is pretty weak. So, Izuku's snowball breaks apart midair, missing its mark by several feet. The spray of particles return to packed flakes on the ground. Izuku stands still, wide-eyed in reaction to his own stunt, arm kept completely extended. He has trouble processing his attempt at a retaliation just as much as he finds it difficult to process his failure. Himiko is just as surprised, gaze flicking between the boy and the snow on the ground. Her mouth is agape, teeth parted as she exhales in disbelief. He should see it coming this time. He should try to dodge or shield himself. But, Izuku gets pelted in the face yet again, this time by the spare snowball Himiko had kept on reserve. The boy staggers back, unbalanced as he's knocked out of his stiff state of freezer. The red spot on his forehead had made for a perfect target, swelling even brighter now that it has been struck twice. Izuku nearly trips over himself running for cover to avoid any additional fire. Just like that, the snowball fight has officially begun. Himiko hides behind the lower end of a seesaw, ducking down. Izuku does a little hop and then spins himself on a merry-go-round to throw off the girl's aim. He slides to use a thick tree trunk as his shield when the playground equipment completes its rotation. Three snowballs burst on impact with the bark. Izuku digs into the thick frost to begin sculpting his own ammunition. He combs the snow with his fingers until it becomes packed enough to fit in his palm. Compacting the ice into a variety of balls eventually gives him a small supply to work with. Then, he returns fire. His throws have a better range to them this time, even if they don't quite make their mark. Amiko crosses the terrain for a better covering where the jungle gym is as he misses each shot. A laugh escapes the boy's throat when one of his snowballs grazes the blonde's shoulder. He hasn't had this much fun in a long time. When Amiko invited him to play, he wasn't sure what to expect after all the years of playing heroes and villains, but this is a lot better. This is just two friends battling on even terms. Neither keeps track of who hits who anymore as they keep chucking snowballs at one another. It doesn't matter. There's no need to keep score since neither of them is trying to win anymore. There's no losing so long as they have fun. The two chase each other around the playground in a fit of giggles and childish screams. Izuku stumbles to his hands and knees when they climb a hill. He tries to scoop up some snow to craft another snowball while he's down, but the coldness has deep chilled his fingers to the point where they now no longer wish to bend. Izuku drops the ice like it's hot, reflexively flinching before stuffing his hands into the crooks of his armpits. Himiko pauses just as she raises a snowball over her head, ceasing fire. She sees Izuku surrender and drops the artillery before jogging over to him. The girl crouches down to her own knees once she reaches the boy. What's wrong? She looks Izuku up and down for injury before noticing the throbbing hue of red in his fingers. My hands are sea cold. Izuku shivers as he holds his stubby little appendages out in front of him. The dampness from the snow has shriveled the boy's skin. His fingers tremble as they struggle to bend and fail. 
Himiko's slanted stare studies the red colorization of Izuku's hands. Her gaze has a predatory glow to it. Steadily, she grabs him by the wrist to steer a hand closer to her eyes. I know a way to warm them up. Her voice is a whisper that blows delicate clouds of condensation in the wind. Even though she's done speaking, she doesn't close her mouth. Her fangs glisten as sparkly white as the snow on the ground. Titu, Izuku is stunned into silence as he watches the girl guide his hand towards her mouth. He can feel the heat from her breath on the tips of his fingers, right before the gentle nibble on the nail between her teeth and his flesh. Saliva moistens his skin again but this time with warmth. Have you ever had your finger bitten? Her parted mouth speaks with a gentle tone that's barely muffled by the digit. Izuku's face begins to heat up along with his hand when Amiko's teeth sink a little deeper into his finger. It doesn't dig in enough to draw blood or hurt. It's just enough to be felt. Memorize it. The pointed fangs poke his flesh a little harder with an increase of bite force. Know it so well that even if you lost your sight, you'd recognize me by my bite. A sharp sting in his finger startles Izuku, but not enough for him to pull away completely. Amiko pricks him with a fang for a taste of his blood, the softest of puncture wounds. The boy focuses on the sensation that he's feeling with an extreme amount of awe. Though frostbitten merely seconds ago, he's suddenly relieved by a warm bite. I memorized it, Izuku says breathlessly. Seeing Amiko's hands are also uncovered by mittens or gloves, Izuku slowly reaches for them with his unoccupied hand. Her skin is soft when he touches it, as much as a cushion as the snow. Amiko gives him a curious look, shifting to surprise when he returns the favor of putting her fingers in his mouth. Though, she doesn't stop him. The boy follows her example and bites down. He does it too hard. Emiko shouts in pain and retracts her hand from his mouth when he gives her much more than a nibble. She cradles her bloodied fingers in her scarf to hide the crimson leak but the red liquid smearing Izuku's lips is completely evident in the white weather. The boy's eyes expand that they appear as though they're about to bulge out of his head when he realizes his mistake. He blushes in embarrassment while Himiko blushes across from him for a different reason. I am sorry, Izuku stammers through red-stained teeth. His hands reach forward and retract, arms uncertain of what to do with themselves. He leans forward, trying to bow apologetically from his knelt position. He winds up falling over himself, landing palms down in the snow. I am sorry. This time his apology is a desperate cry. When Izuku raises his head, his vision is blurred by the tears brimming his eyes. Emiko's blonde hair and red scarf are a smudged shape retreating from him. He lets out a strangled gasp that sounds more like a choked sob when he realizes that she's running away. W. Wait. He claws at the snow beneath him while trying to crawl after her. I'm sorry. His voice a blubbering wail. But just as suddenly she appeared in his life, she then vanishes. Her presence completely disappears as Izuku lands face first in the snow. He's left a sniveling red-faced mess of snot and tears, dribbles of blood mixing in to taint the white frost around him. His hands pressed into the ice suddenly feel cold again, fingers frostbitten and numb. I'm sorry. His voice shakes with the rest of his body. He's sorry that he scared her, that he bit her, that she ran away. Every apology was for a different reason. The next one, I'm sorry. A whisper only audible by the watery croak of his voice is also separate from the other apologies. The quiet one that he doesn't want to admit as he swallows his sorrow is that he's sorry for liking the taste of her blood. He never saw Hamiko during his childhood after that to tell her anyways. Surely, unless he were to run into her again in the future, he wouldn't even remember. Chapter 17, Chainsaw Spree An affliction of gore becomes an inflammatory illness of emotions for the three schoolgirls watching such vehement brutality. Their innards contort like a corkscrew twist in a crude yet shortcoming mimicry of the virulent violence that they're viewing. Travailing throws shriek into Kayoka's ear canals no matter how hard her hands are pressed on either side to cover them. Every paroxysm from the villains is sound straight from hell. Ibarra covers her mouth to contain her own scream, though the girl's state of pale petrification is enough to silence her anyways. Momo wraps her arms around herself, feeling the moist coat of sweat on her skin. A cold dampness sends a shiver down her spine that makes her shudder. Covered in a crimson coat of his own, consisting of rancid blood as thick and dark as tar, the transformed state of Izuku hacks at the villains that dare come too close to the whirring of his chainsaw limbs. None of the girls that he's defending will be touched by any of the severed arms and hands he removes from his enemies. The tattered and torn remains of Izuku's unbuttoned shirt sways with his wild swings as the ripcord attached to his sternum slaps his exposed chest. A collection of criminals who remain out of reach turn and flee, stumbling over their own footing as they run away with reckless abandon. Others stagger or crawl to hold onto their remaining body parts while also attempting to escape. Serrated and wetted, the teeth of Izuku's chainsaw chains continue buzzing in a dizzying sharp spin. The fangs in his malformed mouth gnash together when his gaslit glare of smoldering gold tracked to chase the villains. An elongated tongue whips out of his maw when his pointed teeth spread apart, sloshing in saliva that flies out in varying directions. The roar from Izuku's throat rivals that of his revving chainsaws. More blood spills to follow the same trajectory as the boy's spit, slapping the dirt below to dampen it a deep shade of red. Wailing continues to create tremors of sickening sound in Kayoka's ears as she tries not to scream with them. Ibarra becomes so numb that her hands fall away from her mouth to make way for a spray of vomit. 
Momo closes her eyes as she turns her head away, unable to watch the bloodshed any longer. More of the red liquid splatters over drippings as Izuku chops his blade-mounted arms at the villains. Soon, a slick surface pools beneath his and their feet. Criminals slip in the makeshift mud and roll in the muck. The smell of fuel burning wafts over the landscape stench. Bodies made unconscious from blood loss are strewn across the disaster zone, collected in piles or heaps surrounding Izuku as he lets out a blood-curdling war cry. His chest rises and falls as he breathes heavily, the dizzying spin of his blade's chain starting to slow. Just as moderately measured of a movement, Kaiokan covers her ears and shifts to blink back the horrific sight ahead of her. A new liquid, blacker than the rest, steadily slides down the motorized muzzle covering Izuku's face. Oil leaks from the corners of his lemon-lit eyes, a form of darkened tears falling. A choked sob escapes his monsterized mouth, H hold me. His desperate tone sounding defeated despite the corpses left in the wake of his battle. The boy's arms hang loosely at his sides, the limp state more lifeless than the severed limbs surrounding him. Kayoka's shoes slosh through the grime beneath her feet as she hurriedly moves towards Izuku. Despite the boy being covered in blood like a layer of fresh paint, she wraps her arms around his torso and pulls him into a hug. The girl presses her ear to his chest, right over the cord dangling at its center. She hears his unique heartbeat leveling itself out. The intense pounding from before beats a little softer as it turns gentle. Izuku leans into Kayoka's touch, chainsaws receding from their extended lengths and metallic face melting into a liquid resembling the rest surrounding them. He has a burning blush once the transformative appearance fades away and he's back to his usual recognizable self. Momo's eyelids part hesitantly to see the aftermath, a sigh of relief escaping with the breath that she had been holding and when she finds Izuku in his regular state. Beside Momo, Ibarra wipes away the vomit that had dribbled down her chin with a shaky hand. Ibarra's trembling fingers curl to make a fist, the forced pressure reducing their tremors. Her white robe has been tainted by the stains of the fallen sinners surrounding her, soaked red and dried to stick to her skin. She shakes like a leaf as the vines atop her head writhe with the churning of her intestines. Ibarra sheds some tears, eyes puffing up with her cheeks as she huffs in an effort not to fully sob. De devil. A weak mutter barely manages to slip through Ibarra's trembling lips. Izuku flinches, you're the devil. Then fully pulls back from Kayoka's hug when Ibarra suddenly finds the strength to shout. H hey, come on now. Momo hesitantly hovers her hand over Ibarra's shoulder. She glances between the Class 1B student and her fellow classmates, uncertain of who to side with her comfort first. Midoriya saved us. Kayoka is quick to jump to Izuku's defense. A desperation oozes into her tone as she surveys the surrounding sea of blood. I, I can still hear their heartbeats, they're still alive. Her eyes flick from the bodies to Ibarra and Momo. Ibarra shakes her head, gaze still lingering on the mutilated corpses, her eyes refusing to meet Kayoka's. The anguished cries for God. I still hear them. The blood-soaked girl goes back to muttering as she counters her peer with the opposing sound that still rings in her ears. Slowly, Momo lowers her hand to settle on Ibarra's shoulder. She gives the girl a gentle squeeze. I think she's just shaken as all. A tremor travels from Ibarra to Momo that makes Momo's voice tremble as she says, W we all are. I don't think any of us were expecting that. Despite the unsteady wobble in Kayoka's voice too, he was just protecting us, she remains resolute in her defense of Izuku. She chances another glance at the dismembered collection of villains by her feet. The serpent-styled one that had called dibs on her lay unconscious with his arms removed. You heard what they were saying. WH what they were gonna do, her voice shakes even harder and she tears her gaze away. I know, just, Momo winces when she tracks Kayoka's sight to where it had been. She closes her eyes, willing herself not to look anymore either. It doesn't appear as heroic as it seems. She draws Ibarra closer for her own sake now. It's okay, Izuku's sudden interjection makes Momo skittishly jump a little. She opens her eyes to look at the boy, reminding herself visually that he's no longer a monstrification of chainsaws. I understand how you feel, Izuku tries not to make any sudden movement that might startle her any further and Momo suddenly starts to feel guilty for slightly siding with Ibarra. Reminded of Ibarra, Momo turns her head to see the girl is still on the verge of going into shock if she hasn't already done so. Using the ability that her quirk grants her, Momo creates a blanket from her fat cells to drape over Ibarra. I'm going to stay with Shizaki. Get her someplace away from here, and internally shames herself further for using the girl's current condition as an excuse to distance herself from Izuku. She could probably use a change of scenery, Izuku nods in agreement. He then looks at Kayoka, you all could. Realizing that he means he'll go off on his own, Kayoka turns on her heel to face him in response. I'm not leaving you by yourself. She plants her feet once turned and places her hands on her hips, I'm willing to bet all the other zones have villains in them too. So our best bet is the plaza, Momo allows Ibarra to lean on her as they steadily begin to move forwards. They try weaving around the bodies in their way as they do so. And we're going there together, Kayoka adds with an authoritative tone. Izuku opens his mouth to retort, but thinks better of it. Neither Momo or Ibarra complain as well. All right then, Izuku sighs as he turns to follow them out of the disaster site, let's get going. Within the plaza, their homeroom teacher is occupied still fighting off his own armada of villains. The underground hero starts with one, sweeping their legs out in a low crouch so that he can smack their head on the hard floor once they drop. 
Behind the slits in a yellow pair of goggles, Eraserhead's eyes burn a bright red. The villain he locks his sights on loses their quirk long enough for him to close the distance between them. Aizawa then knees the criminal three times in the gut. A burlier villain grabs a part of the fountain behind Aizawa, yanking out a chunk of the marble. The rock whizzes over the hero's head as he dives out of the way, saved only by instinctive reflex. The fountain piece strikes a support beam, bending the pole inwards as it shatters into debris. Aizawa unfurls the capture cloth wrapped around his neck, whipping out the opposite ends to bind themselves around two of the villains rushing him from his left side. Using the force of the pull it takes for him to duck down and dodge a punch, he tugs on the binding line to hoist each criminal over his head so that they collide into one another. Aizawa uses his footwork to pivot and twist his body with a strong right hook to take out the burly villain next. Simultaneously, his now unwound capture cloth snags the ankle of a different opponent in the crowd. The turning motion of the hero's torso switches to go the other way, pulling on the scarf to trip the villain it caught. Watching as the mob slowly gets eliminated one by one, the villain group's leader gradually grows agitated. He scratches at his neck as though there were stubble there, red eyes peering through the fingers of the dismembered hand covering his facial features. When a racer head crouches low enough to avoid being skewered by a katana and then retaliates with a kick, the villain leader decides that he's seen enough. Namu, a raspy voice gets the monstrosity with an exposed brain to cock its head to the side. That same raspy voice then gives Namu its order, hurt him, by pointing a finger at Aizawa. A hulking black mass of slough and marred muscle lurches to its feet. A heap of unconscious villains lay beneath it, a less than courteous courtesy of eraser head. It moves as though it's unbalanced by its own bulk, the bulging limbs too heavy for its own body. The Namu stomps on the skulls of the villains in its way, the crunch of white bone reminiscent of bloodied snow. It'd be impossible for eraser head to not hear the beast coming with every ground quaking step it makes as an advancement towards him. The hero uses his erasure quirk, getting into a low crouch. Across the plaza, from a perched position on the viewing balcony of the disaster zone he just exited, Izuku witnesses what happens next. The Namu size is deceptive. It's fast, faster than any of the villains Aizawa was fighting earlier. It catches Aizawa in a grip that clutches the man's entire abdomen. The creature's hefty thew lives up to expectations in terms of raw strength. Izuku can hear the sound of his teacher's ribcage shattering despite the distance. When Kayoka makes a horrified gasping noise from beside him, Izuku can only imagine what the bones breaking must have sounded like when amplified. Momo turns her back to the view, simultaneously shielding Ibarra from the sight before the girl can catch even a glimpse of it. Those two have seen enough, each of them reverting back to their trembling dispositions. Their eyes clamp shut, unwilling to replay a visual bloodshed. Though they can still hear the awful yells coming from their teacher, they flinch with every agonized shout. Izuku grinds his teeth as he grits them together, trying not to scream too. Aizawa's limbs sling loosely as he's played with like the Namu's ragdoll. With the carelessness of a child slinging its toy around, the mindless beast roughly slams the man into the ground. Red paints the surface that slowly chips away with every grating blow. Aizawa's eyes glare defiantly, the crimson glow as bloody as the rest of him, until he's slammed into the floor face first. The cracked cement cuts his cheek open, splitting like a seam. Aizawa's jaw unhinges to one side, dangling as his mouth rips even further. That's when Izuku reaches his limit. He can't just stand by and watch anymore. His index finger loops through the hole of the handle on his sternum's pulley string. Kayoka hears the rapid beat of the boy's heart begin to create a continuous rhythm. She doesn't need to hear him say, I'm saving Sensei. Stay here with them. To know the revving is that of his chainsaws next. A red sneaker steps onto the guardrail of the balcony to use as a launching pad. When Izuku pushes off, his transformation transpires mid-leap. Wait, Kayoka's cry gets cut off by the whirring of the chain blades that burst forth. The elongated saws screech as they swing with Izuku's aerial movement. Each arm slices through the air when he begins to make his descent down into the plaza. A shrill shriek erupts from the chainsaw mounted atop the running engine in place of his head, the sharpened fangs within it bearing down with him. The hand-covered villain that had ordered the Namu to attack Aizawa raises his head, the swift motion flicking his tousled hair. When he sees the source of the caterwaul coming for him, he reacts immediately. Bladed tips brush by, every metallic tooth spinning on the edge of a long bar. The villain skids back, the heels of his shoes scraping the ground. The air between him and Izuku splits as though severed, further pushing the villain away. That same gust of wind blows away the pale strands of hair hanging over his eyes. The gaslit glow from within the dark slithers in Izuku's metal-mounted face stare back, an amber substitute for eyes burning brightly. The chainsaws attached to the boy continue their rotation, pointed tips a blur. With every intense rise and fall of Izuku's chest, the string attached at the base sways from one side to the other. The thrumming of the chainsaws shift in the direction of Aizawa and the Namu. The creature ceased its torture, awaiting orders from its boss. To the opposite side, one of the villains Aizawa hadn't dispatched takes a broad swing with a steel rod. An emission of sparks glisten across the metallic surface of Izuku's face when it connects. While his head does turn with the blow, the rest of his body remains firm. The engine thrums louder when the yellow ore buying the villain intensifies its glow. The chainsaws at Izuku's sides rev louder before one jets up to carve under the villain's armpit from where he holds the metal beam. 
The bar drops to the ground with a resounding clang per four bounces. A scream from the villain having his underarm torn into follow suit. Izuku jerks the chainsaw out from the villain and swings his other arm's bladed saw at the next one's legs. Taken out at the knees, that villain falls beside the one cradling his blood oozing armpit. A mighty step forward carries Izuku's overhead swing of his next attack that cuts down the final bit of cannon fodder in his way. The leader of those grunts raises his finger to point and direct the Namu again. Namu, heard him next. That same finger curls over to scratch under the villain's jaw. Atop the entrance steps of the plaza, Kyoka runs with Momo and Ibarra to rendezvous with a handful of their classmates. The ones fortunate enough to have avoided being caught in the misty villain's warp gate let out varying sounds of relief. Though 13 wasn't as lucky, having been torn open from the back in a brief battle with the poor ailing villain. Again, Momo has to hide the gruesome sight of a corpse from Ibarra. Even with Hanta at their hero teacher's side taping shut the wounds, it's tough to take in. Ijiro and the blonde with a lighting streak in his hair stand by the door that's now slightly ajar. Mina is closer for Kayoka to talk to. Kayoka is almost too afraid to ask, what happened? But she's heard a lot worse today than anything her classmate could tell her. We distracted the villain that warped you and the others away long enough for Ida to get out. He went to get help. Mina summarizes the situation on her end while pulling Kayoka into a hug. Kayoka is so used to the Pinkette being a lighthearted jokester that it's unsettling to see the girl so serious. It's even worse when Kayoka can hear the tremble in Mina's voice that simultaneously felt through their hug. The blonde boy beside Ijiro ventures away from the door into the base of the stairwell towards the plaza. Then that villain turned on his boss all of a sudden, he points in the direction of where Aizawa had been ravaged by the Namu. When Kayoka peels back from Mina's embrace to follow the finger's aim, she recognizes the macabre of chainsaws below. That's not a villain, idiot. That's Midoriya. She tries and fails to keep the feelings of agitation out of her tone when she corrects the blonde boy. Mina turns her head to follow the line of trajectory next, raising her hands to her mouth to muffle her gasp when she sees what the two are talking about. That's Midoriya. Her voice shakes more than it did when Kayoka had rendezvoused with her. Ajiro sidles up next to the pinquette, openly gawking at Izuku's chainsaw state. Holy shit. He lets out a breathless whisper that sounds just as odd as he appears. Behind the redhead, Hanta stands up to get a look at Izuku for himself. The grim expression he had while patching up 13 somehow deepens its intensity. Yeah, his voice sounds as distant as he is from the drop-off of the staircase when he repeats what Ijiro said, holy shit. The metallic teeth brimming the chain constantly looping itself around the bar protruding from Izuku's right arm begin to sink. They bury themselves deeper and deeper into Stygian flesh. An explosive burst of blood a shade darker than any ordinary red splatters in response to the entry of the spinning blades. Izuku continues sawing with his arm bar, willing it to dig deeper as he grinds his arm back and forth. A hulking monstrosity called Namu doesn't flinch. It doesn't even release a semblance of sound to indicate any sort of pain. Izuku yanks the chainsaw free when he sees the creature winding up for an attack of its own. The beast moves with a cumbersome exaggeration that it didn't show when grabbing Aizawa. Izuku seizes that difference in speed to make it bleed as much as he can. The boy's left arm swings upward so that the chainsaw protruding from it can carve itself into the Namu's abdominal region. The muscle fibers there pulsate as though they're flexing in response to the foreign entry. Again, the Namu reaches for Izuku, unbothered by the stabbing. Realizing the Namu can't possibly be human to remain unfazed, Izuku begins sliding the chainsaw across its stomach rather than pulling back. He forgets about restraint, mercilessly twisting the cutting motion so that it rips apart the creature's innards. When Izuku does tear his chainsaw free, a spillage of intestines comes with it. He staggers back, surprised by his own ferocity. Except, the Namu follows those steps with heavy stomps of its own. Still, the lab creation remains unfazed, even after literally having its guts spilled. A massive hand grabs one of Izuku's forearms, the buzzing blade slicing its palm seemingly doing nothing to loosen its hold. The boy is then lifted off of his feet, hoisted into the air as though he's weightless. He gasps when he sees from his aerial view that the Namu's gut has begun reclosing. The monster has a regeneration factor to replace its removal of pain receptors, a dangerously deadly trade-off. Izuku lashes out with his free arm, no longer caring what detrimental damage he does to the beast if that damage won't last forever to be detrimental enough. That arm gets caught in the Namu's grip too, snatched by its other hand. Rip his arms off, Izuku can hear the satisfied smirk in the villain leader's tone. In his peripheral vision, he can see Aizawa using his erasure quirk on the Namu in a vain attempt to prevent the order from being carried out. Izuku tries reaching the creature's exposed brain with the chainsaw mounted to his own head, but falls short by too many inches. His feet dangle in the air from his suspended spot above the ground. Looking down at them, he remembers those are appendages that exist too. With all of the exertion that he can muster, Izuku raises his leg as high as it can go to perform an axe kick. His calf tears itself open, splitting down the middle. A chainsaw shreds its way out of Izuku's leg and embeds itself into the base of the Namu's skull. Brain matter splatters every which way as it's grinded up. Finally, the Namu makes a sound. An awful ear-piercing one too. The grip on Izuku's arms slackens. He twists them so that the chainsaws cut at the creature's fingers, severing the digits from its hands. 
Izuku hits the ground hard, landing on his ass. Black stubs topple to the floor with him. Namu, the villain leader cries out for his wounded science experiment. The creature hears its master but doesn't have the brain capacity to respond with an organ that's hardly intact. It staggers while grasping at its head with fingerless hands, helpless and pathetic as it nearly trips over itself. A wisp of purple smoke spirals until it creates a cloud. The foggy specter then shapes itself into the villain that had introduced himself to the class earlier. Izuku recognizes him as the one that can create portals. Tamura Shigaraki, I'm afraid we underestimated UAS Golden Eggs. The villain addresses his superior as though the turning of tides is a minor inconvenience. Yellow slithers narrow as they meet yellow orbs. The villain gauges Izuku while reporting, one of the students managed to escape. Tamura turns towards his comrade with a glare that would kill if it could, Kurajiri. I'd turn you to dust if you weren't my only ticket out of here. The leader of the Fallen League claws at his neck while complaining in a lower tone, useless. All of you are unreliable. Shall I suggest a tactical retreat? Kurajiri maintains his stoic demeanor despite the threats from his agitated boss. Though Izuku can tell the villain is nervous by the way the smoke wafting from his body fidgets like an open flame. Suddenly, the doors to the USJ that had been opened by just a crack completely fly off their hinges. They're completely blown away, sailing over the plaza, one of which lands beside Izuku. The other crashes into the remains of the center fountain. All heads turn towards the sudden arrival of a presence that can be felt by sheer proximity. None other than All Might, the number one hero and the symbol of peace, stands in the doorway. He sees the kids by the entrance first, all of them crowding around Thirteen's body. The smile he usually has vanishes, have no fear students. Especially when he shifts his gaze to the scene within the plaza. All Might rips away the tie around his neck as he announces his arrival, I am here. Tamira stops scratching his neck, chipped fingernails lifting along with his chapped lips as they pull into a smile. No. He gestures with his raised hands towards the Namu as it regenerates its brain and faces All Might. It looks like we'll be getting a continue. Chapter 18, Chainsaw Cry. A boy's soul bleeds translucent tears. As thick as the snot coursing out his nose, hot like blood but desaturated, his eye streams touch his trembling lips. A sour taste saltier than copper bites his mouth. Reflexively, the boy curls his lips inward so that he runs his tongue along the sore spot, feeling the fresh scar of his busted lip from where his father had hit him. His sobbing increases when the sting intensifies. He pulls the corgi in his arms close to his chest, the dog's fur a warm and fuzzy feeling against his heart. Mond, he whines in symphony with his pet. A hug does nothing to suit the organ's itching though. His hands clench as his fingers curl over with a tightening hold, desperate to scratch but still clinging onto the animal for a desperate ulterior solution to gain comfort. I can't take it. The boy hiccups as he strains his voice that's become equally scratchy. He wants to reach for his neck but relents, still longing for his dog's affection to solve the problem instead. I hate. You hear me, Mon? I hate. The corgi tries wriggling itself out of the hug when the boy's nails begin to dig in, I hate everyone. Feeling the dog's resistance, the boy sinks his nails deeper to keep it still. Ripping the corgi with fingers like claws, his hatred carries over into his hold. In that moment, the boy wishes that everyone would just turn to dust and blow away in the wind. His sister who betrayed him. His father who hit him for it and threw him outside. His dog for not even wanting to give up a simple hug. He wants them all gone. All semblance of love rots and decays in seconds. The boy's hands become a destructive catalyst for his hatred. Anything he touches gets destroyed. Mon rapidly decomposes, flesh corroding as fur falls out. The dog crumbles to ash. He stares down at his shaking hands, stained with blood and twitching to scratch at the itch now that he no longer has his pet to hug. His arms wrap themselves over his shoulder and across his abdomen to scratch his back. A self-given hug that gives him more pain than pleasure. His unclipped nails cut and tear into him but still the itch remains. From that day forward, the boy stops relying on others to comfort his skin condition with a soothing touch and starts scraping at it instead. That boy later finds himself presented with a new dog. Not a gift from the abusive father that he killed moments after Mon the Corgi, but the man that had taken him and beyond that point. The boy took that man's name, Shigaraki, and left his old life behind to decompose in the ground. Yet, the orange mutt with a chainsaw poking out of its head reminds the boy too much of Mon that his past life haunts him. He hates it. The dog attempts to clamber up onto his mattress to sleep with him. He punts it off the bed, kicking the mutt so that it sails across the room and lands on the other end. He yelps and then whimpers, annoying the young Shigaraki further. Stay the fuck away from me, he hisses in contempt. It curls itself up in the corner that it inhabits and stays there after that. Satisfied for the time being, the boy lays down and closes his eyes to fall asleep. That night, like every night, he has a nightmare about the awakening of his quirk. He recalls killing his family. The way each and every one of them deteriorated flashes through his mind. He remembers the way Mon died best though. Up close and personal. The touch, the channeling of his anger. Shigaraki snaps awake, eyes flicking open as he shoots forwards. His skin crawls head to toe like his mattress is infested with bed bugs. When he sees the dumb orange mud on his futon with him, he considers that it could be flea infested. If his mind itching more than his body weren't enough to annoy him, the dog pushes him to his limit. It disobeyed and came to curl up next to him in his bed. It hadn't learned its lesson. 
Shigaraki kicks it off his mattress a second time, this time much rougher than the first. What did I tell you? His hands pause in the air when they reach for the dog. They stop short and he moves them to scratch at his neck instead. The dumb dog cries in pain, retreating to the corner it had been in before. He figures the mutt probably just wants him to feed it. He's supposed to give it kibble and pour water in a bowl but he turns over and covers himself with his blanket instead. He leaves that sort of caretaking for Kurajiri to handle. If the dog dies of neglect, he doesn't care. But the annoying whimpers all night long keep him up. He can't go to sleep no matter how much he tosses and turns or tells it to shut up. Shigaraki tosses his covers off and jumps to his feet. Despite his age, he towers over the dog, completely casting it under his shadow. It's smaller than Mon was, though the breed is lost to him. He considers dusting it but then worries his new guardian might be upset with him if he were to do so. If he lets it out of his room, it might scratch against the door to be let back in, and that'd be as equally aggravating. If he lets it out, Shigaraki chews the mended scar on his bottom lip. Carefully, with his pinky raised so he doesn't accidentally eradicate the door, he turns its knob to let the dog out of his room first. Follow me, and then he heads for the front of the building where Kurajiri usually tends a bar. It's vacant at this hour with zero patrons, allowing for him to be rid of his pest without being caught. When he opens the next door, a much larger metallic one with a screech instead of a squeak that leads into an alley rather than a decorative hallway, the dog looks back at him. What are you waiting for? Go. Shigaraki shoos the animal away with an aggressive wave of his hand. It flinches but doesn't budge. Shigaraki looks back to make sure nobody is watching before forcing it out with a kick, I said go. The dog shies away, just short of getting shoved but still lands outside. Shigaraki scoffs and slams the door to the bar shut. He leaves the dog outside by itself. 224 Chapter 19, Chainsaw Exhaust He breathes in the same breath of condensation that he had let out, that vapor vanishing among flickering wafts of steam generated by the warmth of his body. Crystallization with a diamond glow stretches across in a vast expanse ahead of him, a dazzling sparkling community of dancing lights born to reflect sunlight glimmering on each jagged end of a curvaceously spired frozen landscape. The spiked terrain of ice had been a large body of water, the remains of his form having been soaked completely evaporated now. The combination of cold and heat that the boy regulates keeps him focused on the sudden use of those quirks and not the other occupants of his surroundings. Todoroki, over here. So the hero student has to blink back his initial surprise at the sudden realization that he's not alone upon hearing his name being called. His heterochromic eyes shift from the ship that he's onto the ice-sheeted surface below. Within the flood zone of the facility, it seems almost uncanny to be aboard what may as well be the Titanic in a self-imposed iceberg setting. The grinette at the bottom waving her arms to be seen is easier to spot in that sense. With a single wave of his arm, he expels another flash-frozen creation of sloped ice. This structure is slicker than the sharp twists at the bottom so that he slides down it like a ramp. Once he reaches the end, he performs a graceful leap and lands beside his classmate. Upon closer inspection, the girl appears to be uncomfortable. The grinette is shaking uncontrollably. Todoroki raises a brow as he inquires, Are you injured? She shakes her head, no, but wraps her arms around her shivering frame to say, I'm just not good in the cold. I should be fine once we reach the shore though her eyelids droop so low that Drowsy doesn't even begin to describe her disposition. Todoroki frowns when he realizes the effect of the ice aspect of the power bestowed to him can only be counteracted by the hot part of his body. I'll keep you warm. He switches sides so that the grinette can be next to the part of him she needs to stay awake. The heat radiating from his body immediately relieves her vulnerable condition, her slouched demeanor shifting to stand upright. Let's go. Todoroki leads the way to the shore and leaves villains frozen below the footsteps he leaves in his wake. Meanwhile, the footfalls of Yuraka slap puddles, every uptake of water splashing her ankles. The rest of her is just as drenched, caught in the simulated monsoon of the downpour zone. Trying to keep up behind the brunette with legs that have a much shorter reach is a classmate that made the odd uniform choice to wear a diaper. Ahead of them both is the bird-headed boy whose shadow somehow goes even a step further than that. The massive darkness swats villains aside to clear their path. Where the heck is everybody else? Diaper boy wails like the baby he appears to be as a villain gets tossed over him. When Yuraka glances over her shoulder, she sees that the lines of water trimming her classmate's mask are from tears and not the rain. I'm sure they just got separated into other disaster sites like us. She tries to sound assuring but there's a grim undertone that doesn't allow either of them to forget their surroundings. We need to reach the atrium. I'm sure that's where everybody will go to meet up. Another villain rolls across the ground, making the hero students hop to avoid getting tripped up. I hope you're right. The boy's lip quivers with the urge to whine and complain some more but keeps it at that. Yeah, me too. Your Raka's whisper is just as silent and heavy as the raindrops that descend upon her. Only the raven-faced boy hears her, his hum at an equally low decibel. A cacophony of spinning steel cycling through thick layers of flesh erupts within the facility's plaza. Savage swings from the revving chainsaws mounted to Izuku's arms release a resin into the air before the blood is calcified. The bladed teeth on his left bar extension skate off the Namu's chest and leave another laceration. Slowly, the thick hide mends itself with more muscle tissue. 
A secondary swipe leaves a gouge across the Namu's torso to replace the first Izuku created, this one coming from his right chainsaw arm. The brain he had torn into earlier has also repaired itself, though Izuku remembers how long that took and the state of disarray the creature had been left in. One eye pops out with a splurt of blood when he chops down on its head. The Namu screeches, lashing out with a swipe of its heavy hand. Izuku is caught across the chest, the beast's bare knuckles battering him hard. The force makes the boy hiss in pain as he's sent bouncing and rolling along the concrete floor. His eyes blink, the darkness shifting every time that he closes them. What he does see through blurry vision swirls and shakes like he's still tumbling across the ground. Izuku shifts to stagger himself upright, each breath exaggerated as he tries to regain his equilibrium. The cord that usually dangles from his chest is stuck in place by the blood that's been caked there. His legs wobble and he nearly falls backward. But then, he's braced by an arm as thick as the Namus. Oh might. Izuku looks up at his idol and nearly loses consciousness. He's not sure whether he's about to faint from excitement or exhaustion. But when Izuku sees his homeroom teacher's battered body in the hero's other arm, he fights to remain awake. Young Midoriya, can you take Aizawa away from here and evacuate with the other students? All Might's words barely register to Izuku despite the hero's booming voice. When Izuku realizes that Aizawa is being handed over to him, only then does he process the order disguised as a request. He's about to protest with his arms extended but then sees the absence of chainsaws. They can retract. He mumbles his revelation more so to himself as Aizawa is transferred over into his open arms. When Izuku hears his own voice and not the modified filter that comes from a motorized mouth, he puts two and two together and figures he must have reverted back to his regular form. It now makes sense to him why All Might was able to recognize him, and why he's now feeling the pain from his battle with the Namu. What's a hero versus villain battle without a little collateral damage, All Might? The villain covered in hand spreads his own like some sort of gentlemanly gesture before using one to snap his fingers, Namu. In a flash of light, followed by the crack of what sounds like thunder, the Namu and All Might are clashing with one another. Only after Izuku is knocked to the ground with his homeroom teacher does he realize the air force was caused by a sonic boom. The hero is locked in a wrestling match with the bioengineered monster. All Might presses with all his weight, giving it his all in an effort to tackle the larger black-skinned villain, grunting as the massive figure barely steps back. All Might's fist lands dead center with a solid smack against the Namu's chest. But again, the beast doesn't budge. Only the darkened flesh of its torso dents inwards from the impact, seemingly like a leather or rubber coating of skin. All Might drives another fist into the same spot, doubling up on the damage. But still, the monster's abs don't cave in like they should. All Might barely has the time to raise an eyebrow before a clawed hand reaches for his face. Izuku tries pulling Aizawa away when another shockwave ripples through the air. The amount of times that he's knocked down is more than countable on two hands. The boy resorts to practically dragging his teacher's body. But even that becomes a challenge when the ground shifts with cracks. The floor starts to give and sink in when the wrestling goliaths slam one another into it. Hirajiri and Shigaraki have a difficult time standing straight from all the uptakes of wind as well. The Namu absorbs the shock of every strike from its combatant. Every blow bounces off its regenerative flesh. And each of those punches thrown gradually grow weaker as All Might burns through his energy. The Namu roars, charging forwards to meet All Might in another clash. The two become locked together, fighting for dominance. All Might's hands grip tight to the creature's knuckles as it presses into him. The larger beast leans further forwards to apply more crushing force to the symbol of peace. All Might groans through grating teeth as he begins to feel the stress of being overwhelmed. His muscles tense and quiver under the intense strain. Inch by inch, the creature pushes to its advantage. There's a wince from the hero as he staggers just a step. But then he's sliding back, gasping for air while steam slowly drifts off his form. All Might pushes back with his own show of strength, finally overpowering the monster and throwing it off of himself. Witnessing the number one hero take a knee, Shigaraki begins to cackle with elated glee. So the rumors are true. You've gotten weaker. He then starts to clap at the performances Namu is giving him by pushing All Might's limit. We created the anti-symbol of peace just for you, after all. When Izuku gasps, there's a gust of condensation in the air. The temperature drops. A spread of ice rises. Half of the Namu's body is completely encased by the attack from Todoroki. He and the Grinettis was standing by the equally frozen bay of water behind him. You came here to kill All Might. Trash like you could never, he shifts his heterochromic gaze from the villains to Izuku and his teacher. His eyes widen when he sees the state that they're in. Midoriya, Sensei. The frog girl bounds to them with two hops. She takes Aizawa from Izuku while looking them both over, concern written all over her usually expressionless face. Brats, Shigaraki growls with animosity as he stares them all down. His glare only breaks away when the ice trapping his pet science project shatters. The cause of the smash comes from the living shadow protruding from the raven-headed hero student of Class 1A. They just keep coming, Yuraka and the shortest of their peers arrive as well. Although, how? The bird-headed boy gasps through his beak in shock when he sees his attack on the Namu didn't disable it as planned. Instead, the monster begins to regrow the lost portion of its body. Pink fleshy fibers stitch themselves together in a grotesque tentacle-like twist until the hyper-regenerative process is complete. 
Doesn't matter. Nami will kill them all. Shigaraki grins behind his facial covering while the others blanch in horror. The beast responds once it's finished recovering by charging towards the children. But All Might intercepts it before it can make contact. No restraint whatsoever. Truly, you're the pinnacle of evil. He grits out his frustration through grunts of effort as the monster uses its full strength to oppose him. Very well then. I won't hold back either. The hero pushes past the pressure and inflicts his own on his enemy with all that he has left in him. A series of blows to the monster's abdomen are followed by an uppercut and a jab to its head. Every punch is barely perceptible, only conceived as existing by the quick blurs of every grating strike and the Namus recoil from them. There's a power behind every attack much greater than before that drives the beast back. Wind channels as it's pounded it like a punching bag, each shockwave gathering more and more pressure. Plus Ultra. All Might goes beyond his limit while shouting the hero school's motto and delivers his final most fatal blow to the Namu. All of the Air Force gathered releases in that crucial punch and blows the monster away with a tornado's power. The Namu gets blasted through the ceiling and breaks a cloud as it launches into the atmosphere. At that same time, the ground that had been weakened with every blast of pressure as well also loses its hold. Every crack expands and the surface crumbles into a mixture of rubble and debris. Izuku slides down a cement slab that sinks inwards with the rest of the collapsing floor. Midoriya, the greenette girl that had taken Aizawa from him tries lassoing him with her elongated tongue but he falls too far out of reach. An updraft of dust and smoke creates a cloud of thick brown and gray. Izuku chokes on what he inhales, trying to wave it away with one hand while covering his mouth with the other. He finds himself at the bottom of a sinkhole once the dust settles and clears. Sewer pipes protrude from uprooted dirt and gravel, spilling murky liquid. Across the way, he spots the villain that had been covered in hands trying to reattach some that fell off during his own fall down. When the villain turns his hate-filled gaze towards Izuku and also notices that he isn't alone, each of them hurry to gain their footing. Izuku grasps the cord attached to his sternum and frees it from the patch of dried-up blood that's glued it to his chest. A sputtering startup almost makes him pull on it again, but the sudden flare of searing pain in his forehead stops him. His vision splotches red and his face is slick with wet liquid that isn't his sweat. Izuku chokes out an agonized gasp and wipes at his eyes with the back of his hand. When his palm nicks the brim of a razor-tipped chainsaw blade, he realizes that his transformation was only partially done. The sharpened bar protruding from his skull sticks only halfway out and the usually motorized muzzle that accompanies it provides no metallic facial shell. Not to mention there's a lack of chainsaws running on his arms. Izuku rationalizes that he's lost too much blood to be able to fully transform since his chainsaws run on blood instead of gasoline. Still, there's a villain in front of him. Izuku raises his arms and makes fists. He holds a stance that's neither defensive or offensive since he lacks the combat training needed to tell the difference. And still, the villain makes no move for him. Rather, Shigaraki tilts his head to the side and he gauges Izuku. He raises his finger, pointing as he tries to place his touch. Say, your power looks familiar, boy. The appearance reminds Shigaraki of a similar sight. Izuku falters from moving forward, backpedaling instead. Slowly, one of his fists unravel and he places his hand over the string attached to his heart. The cord feels like a live wire, pulsating with a sort of charge that gives him what may as well be an electric shock. It aches. I had a pet named Pachita. Izuku notes the way that the villain's eyes narrow at that bit of information. I can't ever hug or hold him again. The villain's stare lingers, something in the red of the gaze burning brighter than his hatred. Izuku curls his fingers over what used to be Pachita's tail, clinging to it with a reclosed fist. But he's right here inside of me. Shigaraki's lips turn over into a sneer, his tongue running over the scar striking through the top and bottom of them. That means Pachita is dead, doesn't it? The villain's response sounds more like a statement than a question. The tone suggests that Izuku doesn't answer, at least. Shigaraki continues that there in my heart shit is a pathetic consolation, his hand hovering over his chest. He then bends down and picks up a chunk of rock with that same hand. All five of his fingers touch the small bit of rubble and it begins to decay, the dead have no life. The swirl of the shadows behind Shigaraki suddenly creates the recognizable warp gate of Kurajiri. Izuku has half the thought to stop the villain from backing into it, but thinks better of himself in his current condition. As Shigaraki slowly slinks into the portal, but don't worry. He'll see Pachita again one day soon. He gives a few parting words. Then, the warp gate closes. A moment passes where Izuku holds his breath, wary of whether or not he's truly been left alone. Then, he gives out. His legs stop holding him upright and his hands fall to his sides. In a slouch disposition, he releases a heavy sigh of relief. The thick atmosphere suddenly feels not as dense. It's more breathable now. The ache in his chest gradually begins to fade. The sound of a shoe scraping gravel makes him tense up again. He turns to follow the noise but loses his balance and falls over so that he has to prop himself up on one elbow. It's that error he made of showing his weakness currently that makes him worry that he's about to be exploited by another villain. But instead, he finds himself staring up at an equally fatigued individual. Huh, you're the guy I bumped into on my first day. Izuku recognizes the sickly skeletal figure as the gaunt blonde who had helped him find his class when first coming to UA. He momentarily wonders what the man could possibly be doing there before coming to a conclusion. 
Izuku's eyes widen in shock before he pushes himself upright and forces his body to get up. You must have been a part of the reason for the break-in. You're with the villains, aren't you? He accuses the strange person while raising his fists again in case he has to fight. The blonde sunken eyes widen too, along with a gaping mouth. He raises his own hands but holds them up palm open, waving both rapidly. No, 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 you've got it all wrong. His pointed chin touches his chest when he lowers his head in a further effort to show his submissiveness, I'm no threat. Izuku eyes the man warily, sizing him up. The blonde's appearance seems decrepit. However, looks can be deceiving. What the hell are you doing here then? He presses for an alternative reasoning instead of trusting the stranger just yet. The blonde draws back, his expression a grimace. His squirming in place is suspicious, especially with the way he keeps casting glances over his shoulder. But eventually, the man resides with a sigh, agreeing to explain his presence. Take a closer look at me, young Midoriya. What am I wearing? The question puzzles Izuku at first but then he recognizes the colorful torn fabric hanging off of the man's frail form. All might. Izuku can't contain his reaction when he discovers the identity of the seemingly puny person he had first met in the halls of UA. Whatever expression he has on his face must match the tone of his voice judging by the deflated hero's wince that's shortly followed by a timid nod of confirmation. I'll explain everything later, I promise. All Might lowers his thin arms, the limbs noticeably absent of any muscle whatsoever that Izuku wonders if there's any meat to the bones at all. But I need a favor from you, young man. Please, don't tell anyone about my true form. Please, Izuku's green gaze meets the righteous blue of the hero he had always idolized as a kid and he suddenly sees the vulnerable humanity in them that he never had before. Izuku is suddenly aware of how hard each of his heartbeats are. The heavy thumps make the string attached to his sternum sway ever so slightly. The chainsaw in his head begins to recede as he nods. He knows what it's like wanting to keep that same type of secret. If All Might isn't ready for the world to know about his true form yet, then Izuku won't let it be exposed by villains like his had been. Don't worry, Izuku offers All Might an assuring smile, your secret is safe with me. Chapter 20, Chainsaw Dearth A silken surface brushes against Izuku's fingertips. Starting with his thumb and pinky, all five digits fold and his hand grasps at an empty space. Still somnolent, the boy sluggishly stirs in his bed with a groggy groan before reaching for the spot beside him again. Izuku's hand passes through air a second time before slapping the sheets. Though soft, there isn't the usual fuzz that he's familiar with. His eyes blink open, and though bleary, he has a visual confirmation. The cheetah is missing. Izuku springs up straight, his mattress straining under the sudden movement. The fogginess clears from his head and his eyes. Now fully awake, the boy scours the room with his gaze for his dog, double-checking his bed. When he doesn't catch even a glimpse of orange, he tosses the all-might-themed blankets that cover him onto the floor and darts from his bed. He fumbles with the doorknob only momentarily before throwing it open and sprinting down the hall. Mom, Mom, Izuku calls for his mother as he stumbles over his own stubby legs. He finds Inko in the kitchen cooking breakfast for him. She greets him with a smile but the expression quickly evaporates when she sees the face her son is making. But Cheetah is missing. Izuku explains his state of panic before she can even ask. Inko glances over her son's shoulder, half expecting the dog to be there despite his exclamation. When her eyes shift back downwards and land on Izuku's watery ones, she bends down to console him. Oh dear, let's not panic. I'm sure he didn't go very far. She tries soothing him by running a hand through his green curls but the young boy is already sniffling. Do you think he ran away? What if a villain got him? There's no holding back the waterworks and Inko has to hold him close so that he can dry his tears on her apron. She shushes him assuredly and rocks him side to side like she would when he was an infant to calm him down. When his whines revert back to snivels, she lets him have some space to breathe. The cheetah loves you too much to run away and he's got that chainsaw of his to fend off villains. And Ko's words must do the trick since Izuku nods along with that line of reasoning. She stands up to grab the phone off the wall and dials Mitsuki's number. I'll ask the neighbors if they saw anything and we'll walk around to see if he wandered off. Inko already starts formulating a plan to find the family pet and prevent a relapse of her son's sobbing. We can then print flyers if Pachita still doesn't turn up. Oh okay. Izuku wipes away the tears streaming down his freckled cheeks before puffing them up and getting a determined glint in his glossy gaze. I'll get us started then. Before Inko can even respond, he's flying into the backyard to begin his search. Shut the fuck up, Brett. And Ko jumps when the line clicks and she hears Mitsuki screaming at the top of her lungs. Faintly, Katsuki shouts something back that doesn't quite reach the phone. You're lucky I didn't get an abortion. The yelling match continues for a bit before Mitsuki suddenly switches her tone to be as polite as possible. Hi Inko. I saw your caller ID. How's Izuku? Inko sweat drops before wiping the side of her forehead with the back of her hand. He's doing well. Sorta. There's a pause in her speech pattern when the boy hurriedly flies past her to search the living room. You haven't happened to see Pachita around, have you? That stray you took in. Can't say I have. There's a rustle of movement before Mitsuki adds, let me ask Masaru and Katsuki. And Ko patiently waits as she listens to the short interaction between wife and husband before wincing when it comes to the son's turn. Oi, shithead. Have you seen Izuku's mutt? Mitsuki and Katsuki exchange some rude words before she shifts back to Enko and says, sorry but it doesn't look like anyone saw him. 
TH that's fine. Izuku and I are going to have a look around the neighborhood but please let us know if Pachita turns up at your house somehow. Inko sighs and shakes her head when Izuku pops his head in to check for an update on the phone call. Izuku pouts a little but doesn't cry. He goes back to searching the house. Of course, Inko will be on the lookout. Mitsuki's assurance puts a small smile on Inko's face before she hangs up the phone. Though just a glimmer, there's some hope that her friend can help. She repeats the rise and fall of faith with each phone call that she makes after that. Nobody saw him. Izuku squeaks with disappointment when his mother reports the progress she made. Tears threaten to spill again but he holds them back as best as he can. He's a small dog. That makes him easy to go unnoticed. And Ko does her best to rationalize the situation for her son while making sure that she has all the right contents she needs in her purse in order to go out. But now everyone knows to keep an eye out. Izuku remembers the time that his mom dressed up as a pirate for Halloween and let him try on her eye patch. Without both of his eyes, Pachita was very difficult to keep track of. The small dog would weave between his legs and trip him up. Comparing that memory with now, he can understand her reasoning. And plus we're gonna look for him. He adds, that's right, Inko nods with a smile. She slides her arms into the sleeves of her coat before helping Izuku with his. I'm sure he'll come running if he hears us calling his name. Except, that doesn't happen. The two search the entire neighborhood for the whole day, retracing their steps a few times just to be sure. They call Pachita's name but he doesn't come running like Inko thought he would. Izuku becomes discouraged and starts sobbing. Eventually, he cries himself out and Inko has to carry him home. When she lays Izuku down in his bed, he absent-mindedly grasps at the air during his slumber. And Ko realizes that her son is reaching for his lost dog and has to fight back her own tears. My poor boy. She contemplates giving him a pillow to fill the void but knows that he'd probably notice the difference and wake up. All she can do for him is let him sleep and hope that Pachita turns up in the morning. Suddenly, and Ko hears a whimper. For a moment, she worries that it's her son. But then she feels something soft brushing against her ankles and looks down. There, crawling out from underneath the bed, is Pachita. The short dog's eyes wobble and she can tell that the animal has been crying too. This whole time, Pachita was at home hiding and waiting for them to get back. You goofballs. And Ko chokes back a laugh. She helps the dog up onto the bed so that it can curl up with her son. The boy and his pet worried one another sick over nothing. What am I gonna do with you two? She keeps her voice low to a whisper so that she doesn't wake them up. The two cuddle and Izuku's face forms a smile when he's able to wrap his arms around Pachita. The rapid beating of Izuku's panicked heart settles into a mellow tune when he feels Pachita's warmth against his chest. Chapter 21, Chainsaw Talk Another flurry of coughs, thick and fast as the previous fits had been, completely racked the thin frame of All Might's deflated form. He holds a napkin to his mouth, catching splatters of blood to keep it from spewing out uncontrollably. Despite the involuntary wince, Izuku can't help but continue to marvel at his idol anyways. The hero Otaku silently mouths, Oh, he's just like me, for real. All Might is too busy dabbing residual specks of blood from his lips to notice, only looking up after he's pocketed the sullied tissue. My apologies, young man. As I was saying, this true form of mine is significantly weaker than the one that you and the general public are used to seeing. He shifts uncomfortably from his position in the armrest across from Izuku before clearing his throat and continuing. Because of how vulnerable I am in this weakened state, you can imagine why this is such a closely guarded secret, not just for my own benefit but so that the public doesn't panic. Izuku numbly nods, still on autopilot since they were evacuated from the USJ. After medical examiners looked him over, he'd been given a blood transplant in order to recuperate. And now, during the meantime while he waits for his mother to come pick him up, All Might whisks him away for a private conversation in the teacher's lounge to avoid prying eyes or ears. H, how did you get like this? Or were you always? Izuku lets the question linger in the air once he realizes he might have accidentally insulted his hero. The blonde responds with a solemn smile before lifting the hem of his shirt to reveal a gnarly cicatrix. The scarring is so severe that it still appears to be bruised, the spider web of color spiraling towards a more gruesome mark of injury. I received this five years ago in the toughest battle I ever had with a villain. Izuku feels his stomach drop as though the wound is his own. My respiratory system is in shambles and several surgery operations only allows me a minimum of three hours a day to perform hero work. Five years ago, Izuku swallows a lump in his throat but another one forms right behind it when he remembers which villains All Might fought during that time period, D did Toxic Chainsaw do that to you. The boy pales at the thought. After years of ridicule, of having his absent father's identity brought into question and accused of being that fiend, he can't help but feel guilty for some reason. Izuku is relieved when All Might chuckles and shakes his head, Toxic Chainsaw could hardly manage this, but you know your hero trivia well the blonde lowers his shirt back down, covering the massive scar. The villain that I'm referring to is much worse, so much worse that I made certain the public would never know of his existence. Only dwellers of the underworld would hear whispers. Izuku leans back in disbelief, his body sinking into the cushion of his own armchair. 
You can't possibly imagine a villain so powerful, one at the same level of all might, one capable of inflicting such damage. Why you defeated him though, right? Izuku breathlessly asks. All Might offers an assuring smile, but it wavers ever so slightly when he answers. Nobody will ever be put in danger by that monster ever again. The hero's gaze falls to his thin fingers that curl over to form a fist. I made sure of it. Izuku's eyes widen when he ponders the implications of that answer. But he nods in understanding once the initial shock fades away. It's not actually all that surprising once he thinks about it. The boy finds himself staring at his own hands. The hands that sprout chainsaws. He recalls Thirteen's speech about the power of quirks and raises his head to ask, Did you kill him? All Might's mouth droops, no longer holding a smile. We never found a body. Izuku shudders at the implication of that, but I caved his face in the last I saw it, and he finds himself torn between gawking or tightening his jaw when he learns more. All his life, Izuku had made up in his mind a perfect image of the hero in front of him. He had idolized All Might his entire youth, somehow having not once considered the symbol of peace anything other than a symbol. Now though, the boy can see the strained wrinkles edging the corners of the man's mouth, and he knows that the broad smile All Might usually flashes is phony. The man is just a man. He's human. Izuku's hand finds itself over his heart, fingers brushing against the string attached to his sternum beneath the fabric of his shirt. Without Pachita, he'd have been just as human. I can tell from your expression that there's something on your mind. All Might's voice cuts through the boy's thoughts. Startled, Izuku sits up straighter. I'm sorry, Sensei, it's just. Izuku wets his lips as he carefully chooses his words, I used to be quirkless. And it's All Might's posture that stiffens next. Izuku's face scrunches up as he shifts his gaze to the floor. And I'm somehow only now realizing people are more than just what their quirks make them to be. A moment of silence passes between them, All Might nodding despite the boy's eyes being set elsewhere. It's hard for people to not be influenced by their quirks, especially when certain kinds are classified or categorized in one particular group or the other. But it's important for us to remember all quirks are dangerous. All Might leans forward like he's sharing a secret but his voice is hardly a whisper even if it's not as boisterous as when he speaks when in his muscle form. Hizuku closes his eyes, visualizing in his mind the scene where he had always been bullied. Kakan and his cronies would drag him under the overpass of the canal in Musutafu when they'd say his quirk makes him a villain. Izuku's eyes snap open, seeking All Might's desperately as he inquires, but the reason UK killed that villain was because his quirk was too dangerous to keep him around, right? The man blinks, breaking the eye contact. Slowly, he somehow deflates even further after hearing that question. All Might leans back and closes his eyes, releasing a somber sigh. Then, his tone switches to something Izuku had never heard All Might sound like. He was called all for one, the words carry a heavy weight to them. Izuku's mouth twitches, facial muscles forcibly willing him to repeat in a hushed whisper, all for one, he shudders while testing the name on his tongue. Every syllable stings with a bitter taste. Because he would take people's quirks all for himself, All Might's explanation leaves an after flavor in the boy's mouth that makes him worry about vomiting, the ability to take quirks. I shouldn't say there is such a thing as a villain's quirk, young Midoriya. Just that a quirk can become villainous should it belong to someone villainous the usually righteous blue eyes of the number one hero suddenly hold a very dark gaze, and that man. Izuku is forced to look away again, unable to meet the stare. He fidgets, feeling as though the glare is directed at him. So you're saying that a quirk can be given to the wrong person, that it's not the quirk itself that's bad. When All Might doesn't respond right away, Izuku chances a peek at the hero. The blonde appears pensive but settles on an answer, I suppose that is what I'm saying before Izuku can dwell on that response for even a second. All Might clears his throat and continues, speaking of which, this whole thing about giving a quirk to the right or wrong person. Well, uh, I wanted to share with you another big secret Izuku blinks back his surprise, shocked to hear that there's somehow more to know about his idol. He certainly doesn't expect, I was quirkless once too, young Midoriya. You, Izuku's eyes nearly pop out of his skull, no way. Yes, All Might's small smile matches his humored tone but that quickly dissipates when he begins to elaborate. The origin of my quirk is actually related to. All for one. A quirk passed down to fight him for generations that accumulate strength with each user. A stockpiling quirk, Izuku finds himself absent-mindedly filling in the blanks but quickly clamps his mouth shut when he realizes he accidentally interrupted All Might. That's right, though the hero doesn't seem to mind. He scratches at the disheveled hair atop his head before saying, and my time is coming to an end. Soon, I will need to find my successor. Izuku falls back in his seat, feeling struck. All Might's end isn't something he ever conceived possible, let alone the symbol of peace searching for a successor. That's why he started teaching at UA. He finds himself filling in more blanks the more that he thinks about it. I wanted to see the next generation of heroes for myself and make a decision depending on who is worthy. All Might slowly raises his hand up. Izuku is surprised to find a finger attached at the end of that hand, and that finger is pointed at him. Young Midoriya, I believe you have what it takes to receive my quirk. Me. Izuku's eyes almost burst this time. He rubs at them, mistaking them for his ears as he wonders if he's hearing things correctly. All Might chuckles, amused by the reaction. Well, you've proven yourself to be quite. No, no. But Izuku has tears in his eyes that keep coming no matter how much he tries to wipe them away. 
No, All Might leans forward in his seat and then back as he tries to decide how to properly respond to the situation. His frail fingers fidget as he ponders whether or not he should comfort Izuku with a hug. But first, he waits for an explanation. Aye. Izuku croaks out a weak noise as his voice dies in his throat. When he recovers, he speaks with a trembling whisper, Remember when I said I was quirkless? Yes, you. All Might's sunken eyes broaden the depth of their pits when he tries to come to a conclusion on his own, Did you receive your quirk? Not from him. But Izuku is quick to debunk the man's theory. The boy's body shakes as he tries to get himself under control. Izuku finds his hands placing themselves against his chest to feel the thrumming of his heart. This quirk. It came from my dog, believe it or not. The tail attached to his sternum touches the tips of his fingers. I already feel like I did nothing to deserve this one and now. How could I take another? Izuku raises his head so that his watery gaze can find All Might's blue orbs. The hero hums as he considers Izuku's story. He then leans forward, reaching out to place a hand on the boy's shoulder. It seems to me your dog saw the same thing that I see in you. All Might gives Izuku a soft squeeze of assurement. But I understand why you're so hesitant when the hero's hand slips away. Izuku can still feel the warmth radiating off his idol's touch. I'm sorry that I sprung such a big decision on you so suddenly. That was inconsiderate of me. And no, I mean, don't apologize. I'm just, I think you should still consider the others in my class. Izuku shows that he's ashamed with an apologetic bow for denying his idol's offer nevertheless. Before All Might can tell Izuku to raise his head, the door to the lounge swings open and another one of the UA student's teachers enters. Am I interrupting something? Aizawa raises a brow as he takes in the scene with tired eyes. Izuku finds himself impulsively staring at the layer of stitches holding together the fresh scar across his teacher's cheek. The Namu at the USJ had torn open Aizawa's mouth, leaving a lasting mark on the underground hero's face. Aizawa's gaze flicks towards Izuku, making the boy jump in his seat. Quickly, Izuku looks away. He hopes he didn't come across as impolite. Not at all. Actually, we were just finishing our conversation luckily. All Might saves him by drawing Aizawa's attention with a gesture. I'm sure young Midoriya's mother is here by now. Izuku stands up, taking his other teacher's cue. Although, he adds for extra measure to make up for staring, it's good to see you back on your feet again, sensei. Aizawa makes a noise that sounds like a cross between a scoff and a huff, but still gives his student an appreciative nod. Don't keep your mother waiting, Midoriya he steps aside for the boy to pass but doesn't forget to add. And remember that you'll be joining Class B tomorrow, so be sure to speak with Vlad, he'll be your temporary homeroom teacher for that day. Izuku bites back his instinctual reaction of shock that classes will still carry on per usual despite the villain attack, instead responding with a forced smile and a nod. Yes, sensei. He had been hoping to postpone the inevitable. While he does manage to get away from his usual classmates tomorrow, he recalls the way Shizaki reacted. As Izuku walks down the long corridor of UA, he can't help but dread what the other hero students of Class 1B will have to say about his quirk now that his secret is out. Chapter 22, Chainsaw Competition it's a letter, covered by copious crease lines from having been folded and unfolded, all of them fluffy to the outside. The envelope, however, had arrived in pristine condition. A red dot of sealing wax with the UA logo punctuated by melted curves had made it appear as though it traveled through a steam press rather than by the hand transference of teacher to student. A thin piece of paper is soft to the touch in Izuku's trembling hand, the handwriting done with black ink having run through the singular page. The boy's eyes roam the strokes of the pen markings, narrowed to a squint as they take in the strong lines and heavy marks. Aizawa had informed the hero in training that one of his peers had wanted the message delivered upon dropping out of the hero course. His sensei had tried saying the USJ was the causality of the hero potential quitting but a personalized note addressed to Izuku tells the boy otherwise. He had expected some sort of backlash reaction from his classmates, and this is just the starting opinion of one, but Izuku still feels overwhelmed by the reality of the situation. His eyelids will themselves closed, but he forces them to reopen so that he can read the letter. Can you grow a chainsaw from your dick? Minoru Maita. Izuku's hand folds over the piece of paper, crumbling it into a ball that fits within the confinement of his tight fist. His tremors of anxiety shift to angry shakes and he grits his teeth to keep from yelling. Instead, a bitter laugh comes out. Whether the question was sincere or it was meant to be some sort of crude comment as a bullying parting shot, Izuku shakes it off with a shake of his head. His usual class aside, he still has to face an entirely separate hero course, and they're more up close and personal than a note. He shoves the paper wad into his blazer pocket before stealing himself to walk through the door of Class 1B. A blonde blur clears the distance between the classroom entrance and the collection of desks residing within, the source of that brisk movement stopping short a nose width apart from Izuku. He tries not to flinch but fails to keep himself from taking a step back. A boy with a broad grin and his hair slick so that it's parted to the side further intrudes on Izuku's personal space before shouting, well if it isn't another pompous member of 1A. I sure do hope your personality isn't as explosive as the last fill-in. Izuku blinks, his mind registering that the boy is talking about Katsuki. Within that split second span of time it takes for his eyes to reopen, there are suddenly more members of 1B filing in behind the blonde. 
one of which is a girl with her orange hair tied into a ponytail. She has noticeably massive hands that she uses to karate chop the blonde into submission. Izuku winces, feeling a phantom pain in his neck just from witnessing the move. Sorry about Monoma. She shares a matching expression to Izuku's though hers is likely more from second-hand embarrassment because of her classmate. When her hands shrink to an average size so that she can hold one out for a handshake, the girl introduces herself, I'm Itsuka Kendo. It'll be a pleasure having you join our class for the day Kendo pauses before adding, though I do hope you've got more of a filter than our last guest. At that, Izuku can't help but chuckle. Katsuki certainly made an impression on the class. Then again, he makes his personality one that's hard to forget. Kabekugo is a rare breed for me and the rest of my class, so don't worry about that. Though Izuku absent-mindedly fiddles with the paper wad in his blazer pocket when he recalls Minta's unfiltered version of profanity. He ceases his anxiety when he remembers the small pervert quit the hero course. A girl with green hair darker than Izuku's and pointed teeth like Kirishima straightens her posture and flashes her fangs with a grin. Oh I don't know about that, you two seem to be keeping the stud standards the same. She places a hand on her hip while jutting it out provocatively and flips her hair just as flirtatiously. Izuku curses himself internally when he falls for the teasing, his body betraying him when he flushes red in embarrassment. Kendo gives the girl the same karate chop treatment as the boy named Monoma, leave the poor boy alone, Setsuna. Can't you see you're making him uncomfortable? Shooting Izuku another apologetic expression on behalf of the class. A boy who matches Kirishima in more ways than one pushes past the two girls, flashing shark tipped teeth while thrusting a thumb at himself. Name's Tetsu 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 Tetsu. His name is just as baffling as the rest of his greeting when he too invades Izuku's personal space to ask, is it true that your quirk gives you chainsaws on your arms? Izuku shrinks in on himself, giving a meek nod as he braces for what he momentarily forgot about. The initial welcome of the class had lowered his guard and now he has to prepare to pay the price. That's so metal. He isn't expecting the enthusiastic clash of Tetsu Tetsu's own fists turned to steel. Izuku blanches, further surprised by the similarities between Kirishima and Tetsu Tetsu. Still shaken, his body literally trembling, Izuku has to clasp each of his hands together to keep them from quivering. He wrings them together as though he's trying to bleed out his anxiety until he's able to force himself to make eye contact. You're not. Freaked out. Izuku can't help but shift his gaze to glance at the one bee girl with vines on her head. Well, his eyes are drawn in the direction of a boy whose pale skin pigmentation coupled with his unique facial features makes him appear as though his head is a skull. Shizaki described your quirk in a pretty. The boy pauses as he mulls over the right terminology to continue with, colorful way. But, Midoriya, Shizaki's interjection makes Izuku jump in place but he recovers quickly. He faces the girl as she approaches him, mustering up as much fake confidence as he can. Yes, Shizaki. Izuku forces his mouth to form some semblance of a smile and tries to keep his wobbly tone as polite as possible. His fabricated facial expression falls flat when Shizaki surprises him by bending down at the waist. I would like to apologize for the way I treated you because of your quirk. She starts with a sincere statement before placing her hands over her heart and raising her head ever so slightly to look up at Izuku. My behavior was unacceptable and I'm ashamed that it took my return to my class to remember we are all the Lord's children. Izuku tries not to gawk too much when she lowers her head again and repeats herself. Please forgive me. He notices across the room a few hero students with mutation quirks who watch the entire interaction with keen interest. He wonders if they had a frank discussion with her to lead to this change of opinion. Of course I forgive you, Shizaki. Izuku accepts her apology regardless. He gives her a smile, a genuine one this time, to show he doesn't hold a grudge. It's okay, really, lots of people react that way. Actually, I think you took it better than most people do. He even goes as far as trying to make her feel better by comparing previous ridicules. However, when he sees everyone staring at him with wide eyes, he realizes that his comment had the opposite effect. He forces a chuckle that only sounds awkward while trying to smooth over his mistake, and nothing I haven't heard before. I I mean, I heard worse. Dude, that is not okay. Tetsu Tetsu shakes his head while giving Izuku a look of pity. Even the blonde boy named Monoma shares a similar look from his spot on the floor upon recovery. Midoriya, I must apologize again. Shizaki bows a second time. I didn't realize you had received such harsh mistreatment prior to my own, only further worsening my scrutiny. But Izuku frantically waves his hands in a gesture for her to stop. No. Really, it's fine. Water under the bridge. Seeing the tail end of that interaction, Monoma forces himself up from one knee and begins brushing himself off. Good, I'm glad that's behind us. Though he has to duck down to avoid a repeat of his collapse from a kendo karate chop, because we have much more pressing matters. Here he goes again. The boy with a head been keeping his hair pointed up rolls his eyes at his classmates' antics. We made a pact with the other courses to see what we're dealing with. We can't back out now. Monoma tries and fails to keep the wine out of his voice while desperately attempting to convince his class to play along. What are you talking about? And Izuku can't help but raise a brow upon having his own interest peaked. 
Kendo releases a deep-rooted sigh before explaining, with the sports festival approaching. A bunch of people thought it'd be a good idea to visit 1A's homeroom to see what all the fuss was about after the USJ she frowns and threatens Monoma with a raised hand once she finishes with Izuku, which we are not doing. She stops when Tetsu Tetsu feigns a cough into his own hand. That same hand reaches around his head to scratch at his nape while he awkwardly explains why he's siding with Monoma, actually. I do kinda wanna see what the competition is like. Monoma's face flashes with relief before settling into a grin. See, that's one in favor. Everyone else. A few mumbles increase before becoming a chorus of commotion, almost indistinguishable and unintelligible, but they all seem to be a form of agreement at the very least. Find, find. Kendo eventually caves and accepts the majority opinion of the class. But everyone be on their best behavior. Not without shouting at them as they funnel into the hallway though. She turns towards Izuku as they pass by and gives him an apologetic smile. Sorry, Midoriya. Hi, it's okay. I don't think anyone will mind. He returns the expression before following suit. However, he does try to linger behind to avoid the coming interaction as much as possible. In doing so, he's joined by a blonde with horns protruding from her golden locks. Hi, I'm Pony. Sorry if my Japanese bad. From America, she speaks in a broken dialectic and a strong accent but Izuku manages to comprehend her words enough. Hey, hello. Pony, it's nice to meet you. He forgets about honorifics and traditional greetings when she holds out her hand to shake. And don't worry, your Japanese is just fine. Oh, good. At that, she clasps her other hand over his while still hanging on. Izuku becomes flustered and looks around when he realizes she has no intention of letting go. I wanted to say I were bullied because my quirk too, but his panic settles when she gestures with the horns atop her head and she says, I understand. He gives her hands a squeeze to show he comprehends her meaning and nods. Uh, yes yeah, sure, thanks. Monoma stops when he notices the two lagging behind and shouts over his shoulder, Hey, don't be getting all cuddly with a member of Wana just because you feel sorry for him. Pony lets Izuku go and they quicken their pace to catch up as he continues his rant, we're still going to be competing against each other in the festival. Kendo fixes him with a glare to cease the tirade, leave them alone, Monoma. And the rest of the journey to class one goes relatively smoothly from there. It's a short walk, after all. When they arrive, they discover that the other classes beat them to their destination. It seems Katsuki and a few others are already having a heated encounter with the other courses. Among the sea of students, Izuku spots Janet and business mingling around the support department. At the head of the herd stands a purple-haired boy, his voice tired but still carrying over the crowd. Thought to say, I'm a little disillusioned if this is what you're offering. The sunken eye bags carry a weight like his words as he continues. There's a lot of us who didn't make the hero course and got stuck in general studies or other departments. However, depending on the results of the sports festival, did you know we could get transferred classes? It's my understanding a student dropped out and left a spot available in your class. Consider this a declaration of war to claim that open position. The students in his way part for him to pass through until he reaches Izuku. He's taller, eyes aim downwards like Izuku is a pebble in his path. It's a stare that Izuku is familiar with. The boy shoulder decks Izuku and carries on after their brief moment of locking eyes. But Izuku turns and watches the boy leave even after that. If this whole controversy taught him anything, it's that he'll have to earn his place in the hero course. Chapter 23, Chainsaw Challenge Boiling blood sloshes to the surface, burning, but not quite as bad as the aching pain in his stomach. A harsh pounding contracts his heartbeat with his body, that same strong slam in his head. Izuku can't resist the intense force and the more, he can't remain upright, he lands on all fours. The boy reaches up to cover his mouth just as fast, squeezing his eyes shut as he gags on the pain. Even crouched over a toilet, with a sturdy structure to keep himself braced, he sways side to side. Izuku's eyes shoot open and he pulls his hand back just in time as he vomits. Puke excelling stomach acid is streaked through with a darker shade of crimson. He coughs, sputtering, and wipes his mouth on the back of his hand. An aftershock, a dry heave, leaves a thin line of sticky blood dripping from his mouth to the ground. Izuku has to spit to get the metallic taste out of his mouth. Every day as the sports festival drew nearer, Izuku's bloody coughs became increasingly more violent as they have become more frequent. If it weren't for the hereditary condition of his mother, he could have been dismissed as a nervous sickness, minus the copious amount of blood that comes with those fits of regurgitation. Nevertheless, he passed it off as such to his mom and teachers as an excuse to rough it out in the restroom. The bathroom stall becomes claustrophobic when he thinks about one of them walking in and discovering the truth. The effectiveness of that feeling increases when he hears the squeak of the restroom door as an indication of somebody entering. Which, of course, is soon followed by the slaps of shoes against bathroom tile. Izuku stiffens, his body tensing to the point that he can feel his own pulse palpitating. It doesn't help that he begins to hold his breath when the footsteps draw closer to his stall. When the feet stop right outside his door, he can see the blue sweatpants and matching uniform sneakers that belong to UAS gym outfits. A ragged exhale gives away his position but he doesn't quite care if it's just a member of his class that he's in the presence of. Before he can wonder which of his peers shares his company, the fellow hero student asks with a familiar voice, Midoriya. Todoroki. Izuku tilts his head away from the toilet just enough to take another glance behind himself. 
Through the slither of the door frame, sure enough, he recognizes his classmate's unique split hair pattern. And if Izuku is not mistaken, Todoroki's usually stoic expression appears mildly concerned. What are you doing here? Izuku's own face twists and scrunches as he tries to decipher the meaning behind his classmate's presence. Considering Todoroki didn't go into the stall beside him, use a urinal or wash his hands, he can only assume. I came to check on you. Izuku does a double take when he hears Todoroki audibly confirm his assumption. As though Todoroki can somehow see that reaction despite the barrier between them, the boy awkwardly explains himself, you've been gone a while, and the festival is about to start soon. Todoroki shifts his weight, feet shuffling ever so slightly in a strange sort of nervous fidget. Even if Izuku closes his eyes not to see, he can still hear the other boy's shoes squeaking. Aizawa sensei sent you. Izuku tries to think of the most rational reason as to why Todoroki would bother to care. He keeps his eyes closed, trying to make the dark void of his mind less suffocating than the bathroom stall he's in. There's a delay before Todoroki's response that fools Izuku into thinking the boy left him alone. No, I was personally concerned. But the eventual reply shocks him enough to make his eyes snap open. Back in the festival stadium's bathroom, his gaze is drawn back in the direction of his competitor for the day. There was something I wanted to talk to you about before the first tournament. Todoroki's voice draws Izuku's ear next. Izuku pushes himself up before he flushes the toilet. When he opens the stall door, Todoroki seems taken aback to be met face to face. Izuku then inquires, there is. Todoroki shifts to be straight now that he's seeing Izuku's face. As he had previously, he takes his time to collect his thoughts and formulate his words properly. You have a powerful quirk, but choose not to use it unless absolutely necessary. There's something in the boy's tone that makes Izuku keen to listen, I can relate. Suddenly, all of their strange encounters prior to now make some sort of sense to Izuku. His eyes widen momentarily when he makes the connection of their quirks, but he quickly recomposes himself to match Todoroki's mellow attitude. You're fire, right? He treads carefully just in case he made a mistake with his assumption. Todoroki's eyes narrow, a glare directed at nobody in particular shining through his heterochromic gaze. My father's fire, the low growl is also a switch in tone that Izuku isn't expecting. Don't let it be misconstrued, I still have my mother's ice and that alone will be enough, which is why I'm stronger than you, there's suddenly a thick tension in the air that wasn't there previously. Huh, Izuku doesn't bother hiding his broadened eyes this time. A statement that just came out of Todoroki's mouth was firm enough to sound as though it had come from a senior. Such conviction coming out of nowhere unsettles him. I'm more capable. Todoroki reaffirms his bold proclamation. The hand he uses to create ice forms a fist that appears to be holding determination as he declares, I will beat you. Izuku has to blink back his surprise. Maybe some tears as well. And here he had believed for a second that someone actually cared enough to relate to him and his quirk. He makes a sound, something along the lines of a scoff. A declaration of war. Izuku shakes his head and sighs, you're not the first. When his initial disappointment dissipates, he forces a smile and looks Todoroki in the eye. I can't pretend I understand completely why you felt the need to single me out in particular, but I think I get it enough mimicking Todoroki to an extent. He makes his own fist and slams it against his chest. If you don't need your fire to win, then I don't need my chainsaws. Izuku doubles over, blood spurting out of his mouth as he coughs uncontrollably. The burning sensation in his chest returns, the internal heat spreading towards his stomach. He had thought he got that out of his system. Apparently he thought wrong. Todoroki takes a tentative step forwards, his hands at his sides twitching. Are you okay? He lingers while trying to figure out what to do. When Izuku glances up at him, Todoroki actually appears concerned as he had earlier. I'm fine. Izuku waves a dismissive hand for Todoroki to step aside before using the back of that hand to wipe his mouth. He staggers to the sink before running cold water. After Izuku splashes some on his face to cool off, he looks over his shoulder at his loitering classmate and says, I'll be out in a minute and then adds a little quieter, thanks for checking on me. Todoroki opens his mouth, closes it, and then reopens to reply, if you say so. Izuku waits until after Todoroki has left to turn off the faucet and pull some paper towels to dry off. He waits roughly another minute after that, counting the seconds down in his head, to pull out his cell phone and call his mom. The dial tone makes him worry that he waited too long to do so until the line clicks over when she answers. Izuku, I thought you would be starting by now. Not that I'm complaining to be hearing from you, her voice sounds chipper and energetic enough that nobody would ever guess her bloody coughs had intensified as well. I told you that I would call before any matches began. He tries to match her upbeat mood as best as he can. He's well aware by now that she's probably acting just as much as he is not to worry him. But if she can see through his facade the same as he can hers, neither of them pointed out to the other. Do you think you'll be able to watch the first half of the festival, at least? Of course, I wouldn't miss it for the world, especially with my baby boy competing, and Ko doesn't hesitate or pause like Todoroki had. Not in the slightest does she waver or ponder her answer. Moom, Izuku whines and blushes from embarrassment but can't resist a goofy smile. The burning sensation that had been in his chest becomes a soothing warmth to his heart. The room I'm in comes with a television, so don't worry, I won't miss a thing. Izuku's smile fades at the reminder that his mom is currently in a hospital bed. 
Despite his mother's high spirits, he knows that her reason for being there is serious. Did the doctors tell you anything new yet? The hold on his phone tightens as he presses it closer to his ear. Unlike his coughing fits, his mother had hers far longer. The cause for concern became much more pressing as of late. I'm afraid not, and Ko's answer lowers Izuku's spirits even further. They took their tests and the surgery is still scheduled for tonight though. He nods. Okay, well, remember to text me if you learn anything new. I can still look at my phone in between matches and stuff. Izuku tries to maintain an encouraging tone but catches a glimpse of his downtrodden demeanor in the reflection of the bathroom mirror. I know, sweetheart, I won't forget, Inko's consoling response tells him that she can somehow see the same thing without even being there. A brief beat passes before she tries cheering him up. Oh, but enough about me, you have to worry about winning too. Her change in attitude is enough to get a small smile out of her son. Oh, I dunno, it's a tough competition. Izuku chuckles at the thought of competing against Katsuki without his quirk. Not to mention Todoroki's challenge and the boy from Gen Ed whose quirk is a mystery to him. And you've got a tough quirk just like the rest, and Ko's retort surprises her son so much that he nearly loses his grip on his phone. He manages to catch it and hold it back up to his ear, his mother listening to the fumbling all the while. If my class wasn't ready to see it yet, I don't think the world is ready yet either. He can feel the heat increasing in his chest again and clutches the spot where it burns most. But Cheetah's tail rests in his palm through the fabric of his PE jacket. There are plenty of heroes who get critiqued because of their appearance, like Gang Orca, don't let it limit your potential. Izuku listens to his mom's voice over the line and can't come up with any retort to her logic. He can almost hear the smug smile in her tone. Izuku lowers his hand to look at it. My potential? Huh. Todoroki had said something similar. He wonders if his ability truly is ripe for the taking. When he coughs and a splatter of blood specks land on his open hand, he stops thinking about it in favor of wiping the mess off on his pants leg. Was it a cough? I told you to get checked with me while I'm here. Izuku can hear his mom's concern loud and clear through the phone. He has to hold it a relative distance away. I'm fine, mom, just clearing my throat. He feigns another cough in an effort to sound convincing before scrambling for a way to hang up. I have to go now anyways, we're about to start. That seems to do the trick well enough, in Ko's startled response for getting his cough. Oh, okay, good luck. Love you. She returns to her bright and bubbly attitude. Love you too, Izuku speaks with a smile in his own tone before hanging up. Then, he enters the fray of the sports festival. Chapter 24, Chainsaw Stains. Streets stained red or paths walked only by the dead. Blood as dark as the asphalt seeps through his gaping wounds. The crimson liquid runs down his arms as fast as his legs run down the road. He moves in and out of pools of light created by street lamps, the rising sun's slight glimmer making him scared of being left in the dark but also terrified of being seen by what's chasing him if he goes into the light. His arms are wrapped around his guts like he's holding them in. He's so beat, he very well could be. His steel-plated feet scrape the pavement before catching the curb of a sidewalk. He flies forward, going airborne. Then, he lands face first in a bloody heap. It's not the first time that he's fallen. However, it is the first time that he's been unable to get back up. All his body covered in purple welts can manage is a jerky movement that gets him to roll over onto his back. No pale moonlight, not a single star in the sky, offers a glimmer of hope. Just a bare blue like his hair matches his face now. He stares up but closes his eyes. The pitch black void that dares him to blink forces his eyes to reopen and strain to see through cracked bifocals. The darkness tells him to give in to temptation. To just close his eyes. His eyelids are so heavy and the dawn so dark that he mistakenly believes that he does, just for a fleeting second. Trembling fingers reach into his left pants pocket, straining to grab his cell phone. Blood dots the screen when he does manage to pull it out. He doesn't bother trying to wipe it clean with his sleeve, considering that's just as blood soaked. Instead, he taps and scrolls through his very few contacts, trying to find the one person he wishes to talk to in the end. He accepts his fate and prepares to say goodbye. He suddenly realizes how eerily quiet the still and seemingly empty street is. The only sound to be heard is the rings his phone makes as he waits for who he's calling to answer. Each ring is so drawn out, it almost matches his long intakes of air. The wait is excruciating. He no longer feels like he's waiting for somebody to answer his call. He starts to feel like the only one who he's waiting for anymore is death incarnate. When the line clicks instead of beeping and going to voicemail, his breath catches in his throat. He tries to choke back a sob of relief when he hears a familiar voice answer, hello. Stealing himself, sniffling only a little as he holds back his tears, he presses the phone closer to his face. Hi, Tenya. The 30-year-old man's voice wobbles just as much as his hand holding the weight of his phone, it's me. Your big bro, Tensei. The very concerned younger sibling fumbles with his own phone when he recognizes his brother's voice. Once the rustling ceases, he asks, are you all right? The wounded man smiles to himself, a soft weak one that's much too small to be seen by anyone in the dim morning. Yeah, he's so happy just to hear his brother's affectionate tone one final time that he doesn't consider the answer a lie. 
The pressure on his sides becomes too much for him to handle, forcing out a horrendous cough. Spittle dribbles down Tensei's chin, but he's unable to lift his other arm in order to wipe it away. As much pain as he's in, he's just relieved to have this one last conversation with his little brother. Yeah, Tenya, I'm fine. He doesn't want Tenya to worry about that nasty cough though. You sound terrible, but Tenya won't let him off the hook that easily. The Ingenium family had always been an overprotective bunch. If only his brother could see him now, he'd throw a fit. Fortunately, Tenya mistakens his cough for anything other than a beating, are you coming down with something? No, is Tensei's immediate response. After all, he truly isn't sick. But then he reconsiders the alternative of telling his brother the truth, I mean. Maybe. He nibbles his bottom lip, trying to decide what it is he should say. He doesn't want to lie, but he doesn't want Tenya to worry either. He just wants to hear his brother's voice one last time. I dunno. I'm just tired. That's all. He settles on letting Tenya know that much, at the very least. He is tired. And then he tries changing the subject to divert Tenya's attention from fretting over his well-being. I wanted to see how you were. What with the big sports festival coming up and all. Tenya hums from the other end of the line, wanting to ask more about Tensei's health. After careful consideration, he decides to spare his older sibling the interrogation and settles on praise instead. You're so kind. Always looking out for everybody else. Even when you yourself aren't feeling well. That's my heroic brother, Tenya's tender tone is full of pride when it comes to the brother that he's always idolized. He switches to something a little sterner for the last part though, you'd better remember to get some rest though. Don't overdo it. Tensei has to force himself not to laugh at Tenya's antics. He's pretty sure his body wouldn't be able to handle it. Right, right. He trails off as his smile diminishes. The tears that he's been fighting to hold back begin seeping out of his eyes from the edges. Listen, Tenya. His voice is just as watery that he has to pause before trying again, Tenya. Tenya picks up on the way that his brother sounds. So fragile, so already broken. Tensei. He asks for him out of the fear that he may not be there to answer anymore. Tensei's tears spill out from the corners of his eyes, blending with the blood that's already on his cheeks. You know I love you, right? He feels more pain in his heart than his body when he realizes there's no way to express the amount of love he has for his brother. I get busy sometimes and forget to say it, but I never forget to think it. Even with everything else running through my head, you're always there too. I need you to know that. Tenya had always looked up to Tensei as the hero in Genium. Always business as a priority, the well-being of the community. Sometimes, Tensei forgot to be there as an older brother, he worries. In his final moments, he realizes he wasn't able to save his family or himself because of his priorities. Tensei, Tenya raises his voice as high as the level of concern for his brother. He's not sure what's brought on this emotional speech, or why he and Tensei are crying so much right now, but it doesn't feel like a very good reason. His lips quiver as he tries to formulate the proper words to respond to him with, I. But he never gets the chance to say them. Tensei sees something that Tenya does not. So he cuts his brother off to say first, I have, I have to go now, hesitation making him stutter only momentarily. Tensei, wait, his little brother makes it harder for him to hang up. There's a desperation in Tenya's tone that pleads for him not to go. But he can't let Tenya hear what's about to happen. Take care of yourself, Tenya, he ends the call so that he won't have to. Then, it's just him and the one who had been chasing him. Tensei drops his phone, the screen cracking on impact with the pavement as it bounces twice. He figures he won't need it anymore anyway. The hero's metallic heels slide on the concrete, feet pressing in and grinding into the ground. His legs wobble, thin things ready to snap at the bone. However, with the help of his hands, he's able to force himself to stand. Beneath him is a puddle of blood, marking the place of his final stand. Ingenium will run from this fight no longer. Tensei pants heavily, body hunching over more than the man who is currently looming over him. He raises his arms, fingers curling to make his hands into clenched fists. The last time he took on a defensive stance like this, it hadn't been as pathetic. Even so, even if he gets beaten down like he did back then, he'll fight to the bitter end. Just so you know, he addresses the slender silhouette that's finally caught up to him with as much feigned bravado as he can muster, I won't go down easy. Tattered cloth hangs from the frightening figure, part of it billowing in the wind like a blood-red scarf. In the man's hand is a sword as slender as he, the blade stained with ichor. Towering over Ingenium, the being creates a grim reaper visage, the katana substituting for a scythe. Without a nose, his face could easily be mistaken for a skull. Tensei glares at the man who had been chasing him with defiance. His shaking fists hold still. He finds his resolve and faces death head on. Death stares back, impressed with the hero's conviction, and responds with a toothy grin that stretches ear to ear. Chapter 25, Chainsaw Clarity. Strips of cloud streak through the sky, tinted orange by the rising sun that seeps through them. Beneath, there's a blue backwash. That clear color becomes quickly consumed by a shadowy silhouette. It takes Izuku squinting his eyes to recognize the figure as his classmate, Kayoko Jiru. She's reaching down to him with an outstretched hand. Izuku realizes he's gazing upwards, laying flat on his back in the grassy field of the sports festival stadium. How he landed there, sprawled out, eludes him only for a second longer. Then he remembers. The cavalry battle and the obstacle race before it. He reaches for his forehead first, fingers searching for the million-point headband he was wearing. 
The first event had been a racetrack with various obstacles on the course. He managed to get first place using a piece of scrap metal to surf on landmines, a stroke of luck. That luck, however, must have been used all at once. The second event made his placement backfire when points provided for the cavalry battle were determined by the race ranking and he became a target for everyone. He kept his promise to himself in Todoroki. He hadn't used his quirk. Even if he could have warded the other teams off from stealing his headband by having a chainsaw protruding from his head, he played without transforming. Whether that was the right choice or not remains to be seen. Izuku feels the curls of his hair and then fabric. He releases a sigh of relief. Kayoka takes his hand and helps him to his feet. It's hard to get his footing firm at first, but Izuku manages. You all right? Kayoka expresses her concern while gauging his own expression. You didn't hit your head, did you? When Izuku levels out and sees Kayoka more clearly, he smiles to give her a bit of assurance. I'm okay so long as you're here. He's immensely grateful that she was one of the few willing to join his team for the cavalry battle. Kayoka crosses her arms and looks away to hide the blush that creeps up to her face. Yeah, you definitely hit your head. She mumbles and grumbles despite the smile that pulls at her mouth. When the stadium speakers chime to life so that present Mike can announce, the results of the cavalry battle are up, folks. Izuku returns his attention upward. Kayoka looks with him. Posted on an electronic billboard, the top five teams of the event are listed. Great job to everybody but the qualifying groups will be the only ones who proceed to our third and final event, so read him well. Izuku is pleased to see he made it to the final round with the rest of his team, along with Todoroki's team and several others. Amongst the qualifiers is Ada, but the boy seems too engrossed in his phone to care. As a matter of fact, Izuku would say Ada had been distracted since even before the first event began, though he chooses to brush it off since it obviously hasn't affected Ada's performance overall. Midoriya. Izuku's attention switches from eyeing Ada to Todoroki who apparently closed the distance between them while he was deep in thought, can we speak privately for a moment? Izuku glances over at Kayoka to find her staring back. The two of them share a look before he returns his gaze to Todoroki. After a second of hesitation, Izuku nods. Sure. He then follows the other boy into one of the more vacant hallways of the sports stadium. With the second event over and everyone clearing the field to prepare for the final round, the two have a window of opportunity to talk. Todoroki seizes that chance with vigor, his left hand clenching to make a tight fist. You almost made me break my vow. Izuku realizes that's the hand that can create fire and recalls the flames that sparked when he tried stealing Todoroki's headband during the cavalry battle. Izuku's own hand hovers over his chest, directly placing itself on the pulley string that dangles beneath his jacket. He admits, and you almost made me break mine, the thought he had during the cavalry battle to gain an advantage recurring to him. Todoroki's heterochromic eyes widen, surprised by the mutual statement, then blink back to a narrowed focus. I'm not just saying that to make you feel better either. We truly pushed one another to our limits. Izuku returns the stare with his own tapered look. They maintain eye contact for a while, neither backing down. Not until Todoroki closes his and leans his head back with a resigned sigh, the back of his skull resting against the wall behind him. Do you know what a quirk marriage is? He then presses the rest of his body back as though he's sinking into a cushion but shows no signs of being comfortable. Izuku blinks back his initial shock, taken aback by the question. Suddenly, it clicks in his head why Todoroki wouldn't want to use his fire. Though Todoroki goes on to say more and explain it to him anyways, they began during the second generation after Quirks first appeared. Strong individuals would choose a partner and force them into marriage for the sole purpose of passing on a strengthened combination version of their Quirks. With his wealth and fame, my father made my mother's family agree to a marriage much like that. All to get his hands on her Quirk and have me. Izuku swallows any empty words of consolation he may have. After all, Todoroki isn't finished. In short, that's why I'll never use my father's rotten quirk. If I can win this festival without using it, I'll have denied him everything. Todoroki pushes himself off the wall and reopens his eyes. I wanted to tell you this so you understand why I won't make the same mistake again in the final round. Sorry if I wasted your time. You didn't waste my time. Izuku shakes his head before stealing himself, but you will be if you continue to think like that. Todoroki makes an expression just short of a sneer, fixing Izuku with a glare. What do you mean by that? He snarls. I mean, my quirk was literally given to me. Yours wasn't. Yours is your own, neither your mom or dad's. Izuku flinches but doesn't back down. Not even when Todoroki growls like Katsuki would when angry. I shouldn't have expected you to understand. Todoroki pivots on his heel with a sharp scrape of his sneaker before storming off at a brisk pace. Izuku reaches out, even contemplating chasing the boy to prove that they are alike as kindred spirits, but he stays rooted in place until Todoroki is gone instead. Izuku sighs in defeat before heading to the bleachers himself. There, he finds the rest of his class waiting for the next event to be announced. A few wave to him and he waves back. Ultimately, he sits next to Kayoka. Hey, you, where have you been? She asks. Having a fun discussion about quirks with Todoroki, Izuku can't help the dry sarcasm that leaks into his tone. When he sees the concerned expression on Kayoka's face, he quickly tries to assure her, not so much about mine. 
it was more so about his. Though that doesn't do much to soothe her creased facial features. Do you want to talk about yours? She cautiously uses a gentle voice that matches her eyes when Izuku looks into them. When she hears his heartbeat quicken its pace, she reels back, why you don't have to if you don't want to. Izuku shakes his head and reaches out to stop her from waving her hands. No. No. It's okay. I just usually don't get a lot of people interested in it. Without realizing, he winds up holding both of them even after she settles down. The two of them blush and look away from one another. Um, what did you want to know about it? Does. Kayoka's voice squeaks as she shyly tries to muster enough courage to ask, does it hurt? When you transform, a pained expression crosses Izuku's face when he meets her eyes again. He can't lie to her but he can't bring himself to look away either. There's a burst of warmth in his chest as he says, every time. The two jump in their seats and separate from each other when present Mike's voice screeches over the stadium speakers. Each of them blush a shade of red brighter than Kirishima's hair when the rest of the class looks back at them. On now announcing the final event. What else would it be other than good old-fashioned 1v1s? They're fortunately saved from further embarrassment by the burst of excitement Mike's announcement casts over the crowded stadium though. A chorus of cheers that's accompanied by cacophonous applause drowns out Ashido's attempt at teasing them. Let's start announcing the matchups. Mike keeps the hype going a while longer before an abrupt muffling of his microphone which is then followed by... Hold up. This just in. I've just been informed that two of the qualifiers for the final event have opted out and adjustments are being made to replace them with the two ranked right behind them from the last event. The crowd's collective reaction shifts to confused murmurs, Izuku and his classmates amongst them. Izuku and his peers further respond with awe when they discover it's some of their own who are opting out. Ajira holds his own tail in his hands as he explains himself, the cavalry battle. I have no recollection of anything that happened. Not until the end. His head nods in the direction of the Gen Ed students, but Izuku knows exactly which of them Ajiro is gesturing towards. I think it was that guy's quirk. The purple-haired boy across the way scoffs. Everyone made it here by their own strength except for me. I don't know how I got here or why. Hey, I was on that guy's team too. By that logic, I shouldn't be competing either. Ishido pouts with her pink lips and folds her arms. That's not what I'm saying. Ajiro rushes to explain himself better, I'm talking about my pride here. I just don't think it's right. I guess that makes sense. Hanta scratches the back of his head as he tries to boggle his brain around Ajiro's decision. But then why did Ida drop out? He gives up on trying to understand after a while and looks for the other boy instead. The rest of the class looks around too, realizing Ada isn't with them. Izuku begins to worry just as much as he wonders about Ada checking his phone constantly. Though he doesn't get very long to dwell on it, not when present Mike shouts over his thoughts. Okay, after some re-evaluation, we got our first round of matchups. Starting with... Izuku looks upwards, seeing the electronic billboard displaying what the first match will be. Izuku Midoriya, himself, versus a picture to go along with the name, Hitoshi Shinso. As Izuku recognizing the Gen Ed student as his opponent, Midoriya, Izuku jumps a little when he hears his name being called. He turns to see Ajiro fixing him with a serious look, that guy. Whatever you do, don't answer him. Izuku isn't sure how to respond at first, so he numbly nods. Then, thanks for the advice. He stands up from his seat to head down to the field for his fight. Good luck. Kayoka gives him an encouraging smile to which he returns. Show him how manly you are, bro. Hiroshima flashes a thumbs up that Izuku also mirrors. And he's standing across from Shinso before he knows it. He wasn't expecting to be the first match of the final event, a nervous cough coming up on him, but he finds the resolve needed to fight. The crowd roars around him with a frenzy of flashing lights. This is no place or time to show weakness. Izuku swallows the blood that tries climbing up his throat and seals his mouth shut. Yet to show his teeth yet, if you know what I mean, we've got Izuku Midori of Class A. Present Mike announces his presence to the world first. Izuku tries to fix his posture, standing up straight, trying to be as tall and proud as he can. Versus, a beat of silence. Sorry but he's not done much to stand out yet either, Hitoshi Shinso of General Studies. Shinso sneers. Without further dallying, let's get right into the battle. Ready? Izuku tenses. Shinso stays slack. Start. Mike signals the start of the match. Before Izuku dashes, Shinso starts to say something, making the boy pause. It must be pretty nice having a quirk that gets you in the top heroics class, they each lock eyes, and not a villain's quirk that gets ridiculed like mine. Izuku stops in his tracks. Shinso smirks, sensing that he struck some sort of nerve. I mean, you haven't even used your blessed ability yet. I, on the other hand, I'm forced to be judged under a spotlight. He gains enough confidence when he sees the way Izuku expressively reacts to his taunting that he even takes a step forward. You must have had everything handed to you that you never stop to think what it means to actually earn something. That's the last chord that needs to be struck for Izuku to respond. Unable to resist or restrain himself, he shouts angrily, you don't know. It feels like a bucket of ice cold water has just been dropped over him. The fire in his eyes gets snuffed out, glazing over. The tensing of his muscles become even tighter, confining him, holding him in place. Shinso's quirk takes control. 
Damn it, Midoriya, I warned you. Ajiro slaps a hand against his face when he recognizes the effect of Shinso's quirk overtaking Izuku. Shinso smirk stretches, his lips parting to make a grin. I win, he chuckles to himself. Oi, oi, hey, hey, what's going on? This battle is just beginning. Show us some spirit. Present Mike's voice shouts from the stadium speakers but sounds ever so distant to Izuku's ears. Mere seconds into the match and Midoriya is frozen in place. There's something muffling the boy's hearing. Almost as though he's completely underwater now. Though he does register the words enough to understand his situation is a dire one, he's not even twitching. Could this be Shinso's quirk? Suddenly, his ears clear enough that he can hear Shinso say, turn around and walk out of the ring the order resonates strongly in him. His body jolts, acting of its own accord. Izuku watches himself shift and turn to obey, much to his horror and awe. Whoa, Midoriya is following orders like a good little boy. Present Mike reacts for the audience to Shinso's brainwashing effect but Izuku's hearing is back to being muffled. Gradually, Izuku sways side to side with each exaggerated stomp towards the brink of the ring. No matter the amount of willpower he tries to use to stop himself, he keeps going. All he can do is helplessly watch. He looks at the dark hallway waiting for him. There's nobody there waiting to console him. Not his mom, not Kayoko or any of his friends. Just an empty corridor. A high-pitched yap breaks through the muffling effect on his ears. Izuku's heart thumps in his chest. He recognizes that bark. He hears it a second time, this time much louder. Much closer. Izuku's eyes regain some of their color when he sees a familiar sight. Emerging from the hallway ahead of him, trotting on all fours, is none other than Pachita. The small dog walks right up to him, by the edge of the ring. Pachita's tail flicks back and forth, wagging. If his eyes weren't so dry, Izuku would be shedding tears. He continues to fight Shinso's hold on him but all he can do is look down at his old friend. Just like Pachita had done when saving him, Pachita begins to speak. Izuku, I thought you were going to show me your dream. The little dog tilts its head to the side as though the chainsaw protruding from it is too heavy. That's why I passed my power to you. Izuku strains to speak, wanting to respond. He has so much he wants to say. That he doesn't deserve the quirk Pachita entrusted to him. It shouldn't belong to him. Izuku wants to shout that the power belonging to Pachita should only be used to bring about Pachita's dream and not his own. Somehow, Pachita seems to smile, his eyes creasing with the odd expression. It's as though Pachita could understand every single one of those thoughts as he says, I belong to you. We made a contract, remember. You saved me and earned my power. Pachita begins to trot forward again, gaining traction and speed. Izuku, my dream. Pachita hops, clearing the gap between boy and dog. You already fulfilled it. Pachita leaps right into Izuku's chest to be caught in his arms. My dream was only ever to have someone hug me. Izuku's arms cross over himself as he regains awareness of his surroundings and his hearing returns to him. The numb effect is gone and yet he feels the loss of Pachita cradled against him immediately. The dog's tail dangles from his sternum beneath his jacket. He feels tears brimming his eyes. Midoriya. He appears to be back in control. Present Mike notices the change in Izuku's demeanor just in the nick of time. Izuku breathes heavily as he continues holding himself, Pachita's words resonating in his heart quite literally. How? You shouldn't have control. What did you do? Shinso takes a step back as panic settles into his system. There's a shift in the whole atmosphere that makes him sweat. Izuku slowly turns himself around to face his opponent. All of the ill effects recede and he feels rejuvenated. Shinso's quirk was the cold bath that he needed to cleanse his disease. The hot feeling in his chest. The bile in his throat. It's all gone. He feels like an engine being revved to life. Seeing Pachita again, to gain some much needed clarity, that wouldn't have been possible without Shinso's quirk. Izuku smiles and doesn't bother wiping away the tears streaming down his cheeks as he says, thank you. Already flabbergasted, Shinso is struck by a second shock when Izuku wraps his arms around him. The boys suffer a wave of whiplash as Izuku's hug tackle carries them towards the other side of the ring. One goes out of bounds, and the other, in a shocking turn of events, goes on to live their dream, I-Z-U-K-U-M-I-D-O-R-I-Y-A wins. Thank you for joining us on this incredible journey through what if Deku was Chainsaw Man. I hope you found it as intriguing and thought-provoking as we did. A big shout-out to Just Low for crafting such a compelling story. Don't forget to check out their profile on fanfiction.net for more amazing works, the link is in the description below. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and don't forget to subscribe to Quirky What If for more fascinating explorations into the world of fanfiction and fantasy. Your support helps us create more content like this, and we're always excited to hear your thoughts and suggestions in the comments section. See you guys in the next video.